Okay, we are calling to order uh, public meeting 250 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission on Tuesday, October 14th, 10 o'clock, <coughs> at our offices at 101 Federal Street. First item on the agenda, as always, is the minutes. Commissioner Stebbins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, enclosing your me uh, packet of the meeting minutes from July 26th, 2018, I move that the Commission adopt the uh, meeting minutes subject to any immaterial uh, corrections or grammatical changes. Second. Any comments? Um, I had one that was pretty small, but um, on page three, uh, it's talking about the, uh, we, we had the conversation about um, whether and what to do for, for Region C. And in the paragraph that starts out to summarize, this is where Executive Director sort of summarized what he, his takeaway from that conversation. It says, um, over the next 30 to 45 days, ask staff, staff to focus on a response to the MG&E letter. And what's written here is, and then think about the broader issues to consider. It was more specific than that. Um, it was really to prepare topics that will follow in the broader discussion. And then he went on to list, yeah, I don't think you need to list them, but he mentioned such things as um, the market study, expressions of interest, public comments, and so forth. So it, I don't want us to wake up this time next month and be right in the same place. There's some prep work that's meant to be going on. So something like prepare the topic for topics that will follow in the broader discussion. Anybody else? Um, with that amendment, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, the ayes have it unanimously. Next up is our administrative update from Executive Director Bedrosian. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, as you can imagine, we are just about 10 days out from MGM's opening. Wow. Um, staff is uh, very focused on that, but there are one or two other issues I want to update you on, one being the uh, pending review of wind resource suitability. Um, so the Investigations Enforcement Bureau has reported to me that they are entering their final stage of their investigation, and as many of you have likely seen from recent media reports, Wind Resorts has announced the completion of their independent review by the board's special committee. Um, we have repeatedly stated from the beginning that one of the four primary elements of the IB's review centers on an assessment of Wind Resorts and the board's response to the findings of its in independent review. Investigators will now review and evaluate this additional information and expect to conclude their work by the end of this month. Once the IEB's investigation is complete, we'll turn to our attention to commissioners' preparation and finalize the format and logistics required for the public pre presentation of the findings. So that's uh, an update on the one thing beyond MGM. Great. I just want to, through you, Commission, uh, Director, um, to thank the IEB, I, I don't think anybody, I don't see anybody, well, maybe some people here from the IEB, but um, we put a huge, complicated, nuanced, important task on them, even as we had a huge, complicated task of opening the MGM resort, staffing <coughs> up dozens of people and so on and so forth, and that, that they've been able to do this, um, I trust with their standard professionalism, and to do it on schedule, um, even as we're on schedule and ready to open MGM. Um, I just wanted to thank them and point that out through you. Um, I believe, I don't think you said this explicitly, but I think the plan is that we will hope to have our public meeting where we will um, present and discuss the, the investigation in next month, right? Sometime in September. I, I would say that's what our goal is with all the caveats is, uh, Right. The commissioners would know about investigations, but yeah, I think that's our, our goal. Okay. Great. All right. Else? So, well, no, now we can turn to uh, the, the task that's most directly in front of us, which is MGM. Um, before I turn it over on the, um, an issue regarding the iconic sign, just an update of, you know, what's happening in the next 10 days. Uh, MGM has their own internal test um, uh, day this afternoon. That's for their own internal uh, consumption. They'll have their employees uh, on the gaming floor um, and they'll be evaluating themselves. We will have people there to observe. More importantly, uh, the 16th and 20th are two formal 
evaluation times where we will have people, there will be invited guests and we'll have people there and we will do uh, formal evaluations of how things are going on the floor and have meetings with uh, MGM afterwards and discussions if there are any issues that need to be corrected. Um, assuming, and Commissioner Stebbins will have the, the pleasure of some late nights, I think, um, assuming uh, everything goes well, and, and we, we do assume that, um, there would be a temporary certificate of operations issued sometime between the 20th and 23rd uh, with, as you know, a uh, press conference on the 23rd um, in a, uh, a VIP um, evening and then opening, official opening on the 24th. Um, so with the Clyde it's, it's, it's hard to believe, but that's the next 10 days. Um, I think we'll have a uh, not given number, but a, a strong number of staff out there working. They have been working, so there are going to be some there will be some long nights, long days for staff. And, and just as our, our IEB doing the uh, the wind review, we've had a lot of folks who've kept their eye on the ball on this. So I would want to thank them because they've worked incredibly hard. And so far, and I'm knocking on fake wood here. Um, we, we've we, it's been relatively smooth, so I do want to thank them for that. Great. Um, having said that, it, 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 these things don't go without some issues. And one of the issues that has uh, sort of popped up is, is some of the signage, um, which then I'll turn it over to uh, um, Budman Ziemba. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Um, so today's issue relates to the iconic sign that MGM is uh, operating on its garage. Uh, as you're aware, the Commission uh, on numerous occasions has reviewed plans for the signs and has expressed at certain times uh, some concerns uh, relative to the operation of that sign. Um, as we all know that uh, there has been an ongoing concern with distracted driving uh, throughout the United States and most recently uh, specifically with, with the growth of the use of, of phones for uh, texting and others, it has become a substantial concern. But today's issue relates to the use of uh, advertising um, alongside I-91. Um, here, I wanted to just provide the general context of the regulations that apply or, or don't apply uh, in this instance to the sign that faces I-91. Um, uh, MGM will provide a little bit more detail about what they're proposing for the use of that sign, and they have some video uh, showing their, their use, and they also have some video showing what that sign looks like from various vantage points on I-91. But let me just first give you a little bit of the background regarding uh, how these signs are regulated, both at the federal level, state level, um, and also at the local level, um, by agreements with the federal government through the Federal Highway Administration states have agreements to regulate um, signs that promote that promote advertising adjacent to um, national highways and um, let me just give you a little background as as it was um, provided in a summary through a federal highway mem a memorandum in 2007 uh, it it uh, relates the it relates to the highway beautification act uh, which was passed way back when in, 19, uh, in the early 60s, I think. Um, and what, what this summary says is that the HPA, HBA requires states to maintain effective control of outdoor advertising adjacent to certain controlled routes. The reasonable, orderly, and effective display of outdoor advertising is permitted in zoned or unzoned commercial or industrial areas, signs, displays, and devices whose size, lighting, and spacing are consistent with customary use determined by agreement between the several states and the secretary may be erected and maintained in these areas. Most of these agreements between the states and the secretary that determine the size, lighting, and spacing of conforming signs were signed in the late 60s and early 70s. So after uh, many of these agreements were formed, uh, the, the U.S. government tried to rationalize how all of these uh, electronic signs were being regulated among the various states. And in 2007, they issued some guidance to the states, uh, providing some recommendations on how those uh, should be regulated by the states, noting that it is up to the states to do the effective control of that advertising. Um, in that report, they did recommend uh, an eight second minimum uh, change time between images that appear on electronic signs. And there were also recommendations included in that, in that guidance uh, against moving images or movies um, on the sides of highways. 
Now, uh, there is a difference. What we've included in your packet, we included um, uh, most of these materials in your, in your packet, but uh, what I'm referring to now is, is off-site advertising. There's a difference between off-site advertising and on-site advertising. Off-site advertising is basically what you can imagine it is. Uh, you have a billboard that promotes uh, businesses or organizations uh, that are not necessarily on the premises of, of the particular sign. And they're really meant as true advertising. And so the federal guidance uh, relates to those off-site advertising signs. And that's what generally the states uh, regulate. So if you take a look at all of the states, they generally have some pretty uh, standardized rules uh, similar to that eight second no moving image rules uh, that apply to all of those sort of outdoor advertising uh, devices. Um, on top of that, there is also local regulation. Local regulations through their zoning codes can apply different standards uh, to, those, to those signs. And indeed, Springfield uh, did um, include some measures that regulate the uh, use of the MGM sign. What Springfield did a, a little while ago, I think it was back in 2016, they included two different provisions. And one, they required a uh, report from a licensed professional uh, to come and opine on the use of the sign. Uh, and secondly, they called for the ability to study the sign after it is operational. And then the uh, city council retained the ability to provide additional conditions on that sign uh, on a number of different categories, uh, including moving images. Uh, the report. My, John, just, can I just get this straight? Because I wasn't sure on this. So, in the Springfield government has said it would be okay with them to open up with moving images after you've had a study done, and after it's been running for a while, we would then reconsider whether we'll let you continue to run moving images. That's that exactly right. right. So. They have essentially approved moving images subject to a subsequent analysis. That's exactly right. Okay. That is exactly right. That's where we stand today. Okay. Um, so uh, after the uh, initial requirements were passed uh, by the city of Springfield, uh, MGM did conduct that, that study. That study is included in, in your book. And uh, in contrast to a study that was directly related to the particular sign, the study was more of a compendium of studies. And uh, in essence, the major findings of the study that, it, that is included is that from a st statistical vantage point, that they couldn't demonstrate uh, safety impacts as a result of electronic signs. But I will relate one thing included in that report uh, that relates directly to moving images. So if you pull up. the VHB memorandum, which is the Second. Fitzgerald yeah. memo. Yeah. Page number? Page number two. Mm -hmm. Highlighted. Highlighted at the bottom with the mm -hmm. green marker. <clears throat> that study said during the literature review, uh, VHB conducted a literature review <clears throat> as, as of uh, uh, the time of the report. And they said, during the literature review, it was also noted that the off-site billboard industry has voluntarily chosen to adopt practices that minimize driver distraction. For example, most off-site billboards display static images and retain the same image for at least eight seconds. This serves two purposes. First, the driver needs to only take a brief glance to be able to absorb the information, as opposed to a video image that would invite a lengthy look from a driver. Second, the driver will eventually become accustomed to the message being displayed for eight seconds or more on electronic billboards and will understand that there is no need to attempt to read the billboard during a complex driving maneuver, e.g. lane change, out of fear that the message will be missed. Instead, the driver can plan a glance based on the traffic conditions, knowing the message will be displayed for a reasonable amount of time. John, you mentioned the off-site. Were you going to talk, are there uh, different guidance for on-site, which appears to me this is what, what we have here? So this is, this is, appears to be on-site. We have a uh, memorandum from uh, MGM Springfield's outside council that notes that this is uh, a on-site premise uh, sign, on-premise sign. 
because it, it is not effectively advertising for other businesses. They do note some exceptions uh, in their memorandum. So indeed, so this would not necessarily fall within the rubric of the state regulation for off-site premises signs. The state regulation does call for a 10 second minimum threshold for changeable signs, but arguably uh, based on that uh, memorandum, this is outside of that state rubric. So we would fall um, within the Springfield uh, regulation unless, uh, the, unless the commission wants to consider other actions based on potential distraction that may be caused. One thing I will mention is that um, the standard that is utilized in the industry for driver distraction is two seconds, that you don't want to have anything that causes more than two seconds worth of distraction or else it could pose a danger on the highway. So are there no on-site rubrics, as you say? No, th that, is, that is correct. To the best of our knowledge, there is no state regulation regarding on-site on advertising yeah. um, that, that is applicable here that would be solely related to the Springfield jurisdiction. Okay. So I, I, less, uh, one thing I will mention is that there were a couple of examples uh, that were mentioned in, in the report. First of all, the, the report does uh, summarize a number of different outside studies that show that there is an impact from electronic advertising in general that it does pose a safety concern. It also noted in numerous other uh, studies that it said that, uh, uh, that there, there should be no real concern from electronic um, uh, billboards. Um, but um, there were two examples in here of Massachusetts-based uh, signs that provide an example. And the, the one, there's one in Springfield at the Basketball Hall of Fame, and then there's one at, which is the w WGBH uh, building. Um, I drive past that almost every single day, and when it was first authorized, that there was an agreement between uh, the local residents, the Boston Redevelopment Authority, and, the, and I believe the Turnpike Authority, based on public r reports, that limited the use of that sign um, and uh, restricted uh, moving images on that sign. I will note that, that I have seen at least once or twice uh, over the last year or so um, that the sign has moved. Uh, indeed, today uh, it was moving quite a bit. Um, but I, uh, I just mentioned that as the context that, that there was some careful deliberations at the time uh, between all, all of these various entities to try to promote the uh, safety of that, of that sign. And that was an example of, of one of the um, uh, signs uh, that is, is demonstrative of safety in the VHB report. Uh, but, and they also referenced that there really has not been any significant um, uh, any significant assemblage of accidents that resulted from that sign, but partially that could relate to the fact that it has not really been a dynamic uh, sign for the most part over that period of years. So there was an agreement. It is um, under regulation by those three groups. Is that right? So I believe that it is guided by uh, the Boston Redevelopment Authority. They're basically their local zoning. Um, I uh, took a look at their uh, 2004 mm -hmm. uh, report, and that referenced a side agreement between the Boston Redevelopment Authority and WGBH. And as of yet, I have not been able to get that memorandum, which spells out the specific details. But what was publicly reported at the time um, is that uh, it had some very, very concrete requirements in it. In one report that I read, it says the WGBH mur mural displays at most three still images and sequences over a 30 second time frame. We wanted, uh, according to the station director at the time, they wanted it to be slow from the beginning. The images do not contain wording or phone numbers to keep driver distractions to a minimum, uh, given that there's half a million vehicles that pass by it weekly. So but a 30 it, second time frame. Yeah, so basically that's consistent with the national standards. If you multiply eight by three, that's the 30 second time frame. But, but again, I do want to make now, sure I have seen that move. They now do have moving video. As of today was the most visible moving uh, video that I've seen in six years. Um, but I have seen, I think I saw a flower uh, grow once. Um, as you've seen those sort of slow motion flowers grow, I think I saw that once maybe about a year ago. I know that's anecdotal, uh, but 
But is this, this uh, an example because of this, the, 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 the same reasons um, that it's also promoting of on-site. It's on site of the. Uh, uh, it's promoting the the business of the WTA. of the building. Okay. It's not promoting any other things, is it? That's correct. As well as the um, basketball hall of fame, it promotes the basketball hall of fame, not any other advertising. That's correct. So it all falls under the same rubric, as you say, the agreement with the local jurisdiction. Yes. In, in the basketball hall of fame, I've seen the sign. It it again. It's very small. It's not the large um, sign that we're talking about here. Does that have moving stuff? It, it has um, some limited, my understanding is it has some, and I, we, we've been talking this, trying to do our research. It has some uh, movement, but again, it's, it's narrow and the size is what, maybe? Maybe at most one quarter of the size of the yeah. MGM sign, right. potentially. You, you also mentioned that uh, the study, which we have seen before, um, was commissioned by, by, by the city or by, by MGM, required by the city? It was required by the city, commissioned by MGM. Commissioned by MGM, and um, you characterized it as, I, I think appropriately, as a compendium of studies. Was that the scope of the study in the, uh, in the eyes of the city? Well, I believe the city w was satisfied with the scope of the study, but the, I'll just read specifically from the language of the, uh, of the memorandum. If you take a look at the City of Springfield site plan review, it said that the petitioner shall provide a report to the Office of Planning and Economic Development from a transportation professional experienced, and this is on page. Yep, the last page it's in of the that. Bank. Yep. Uh, in the field of traffic study impacts per Article 8, Section 8.575C, the report shall set forth an opinion as to whether or not the operation of the sign would meet safety standards and include the basis for such opinion, specifically reviewing any adverse effects to highway traffic flow and safety with regard to distraction from animation, brightness, or the size of the signs. This report shall be submitted to the OPED and reviewed prior to the issuance of the sign permit. So does the report uh, issue that opinion? Well, uh, I'll leave it to the MGM Springfield uh, folks to, to detail that, but it certainly does um, talk about animation in one section, and it talks about more of the general compendium of, of studies, uh, which, uh, go, as I mentioned, go back and forth. But I think what they, uh, what the, the consultant that issued the report issued that final finding that based on statistics, that there was no way to uh, demonstrably demonstrate um, the safety impacts as a result of the statistical finding, perhaps rather than the specific sign itself. Well, it was that question then to to um, the MGM people. Do, do you feel that the report expresses the opinion that was required here as part of the site plan review? Uh, commissioners, we do. It, I mean, it's the language in the site plan review. Uh, I was involved in retaining the expert. Um, and had several discussions with BHP on this. The language that was used around an opinion on, it, it was hard in a vacuum um, without the sign being constructed, without the programming, without being able to witness the sign itself and see the impact to formulate a specific opinion about the safety of that sign in particular. So um, in advance, in order to get a sign permit so we could build it, the only thing that the expert was left with was, well, what's out there? literature review, what are statistics, what do I understand is proposed, and, com and compare it. So I think, um, I think they provided the best um, opinion they could at the time with the information available. And I think one important point in that same um, site plan review, um, we were talking about um, the, the sign pre-permit, but there's also language in that approval um, on paragraph D4 that says that um, and I'm reading straight from the site plan, um, the, the signage um, approval um, by the city, the same document that we're referencing the language in. Um, it, it also requires a review of the proposed signs solely as the materials, lighting, moving images, portability, and impacts to abutters and or any public ways shall be completed after the approved signs have been installed and are operational to determine if any additional conditions are required. 
And so I think that the approval contemplated that we're going to look at it in advance to get some information to allow the permit to issue. And then once it's operational, we have an obligation to look at it and perform some review um, uh, and be able to do that specific review um, using information available at the time. And um, we have, I don't believe it's in the packet, but we've been working with the city of Springfield uh, and the city solicitor to come up with a, a proposed study um, to look at the sign as soon as we turn it on. Um, and then once traffic normalizes three months out and a year out, uh, to look at crash data and look at the operation of the sign to, to do that analysis. So I think it's a two-part analysis. Is it, it, does the literature show that it's, um, that it's a problem to prevent issuance of the permit? The answer is no. The city was comfortable issuing the permit. And then we look at the actual sign and perform some analysis once it's operational is what I believe was contemplated and what, we've, um, what we're pre prepared to do. So in other words, there would be an update to the study uh, if, if Well, it's a separate, we actually have a, um, I've been working with TEC, who's our traffic consultant, and we have a proposal that they just um, provided an outline. We haven't engaged them yet, but um, we have a proposal of that study, which we're prepared to move as soon as we turn the sign on before we open in the next week to get some baseline information and then um, look at it uh, once we have, we're, so the, the time period that they propose is, um, suggest the time periods for data evaluation um, post MGM opening, uh, post MGM opening a six month period from roughly 12-1, 2018 to 5-31-2019 that allows for the grand opening traffic volumes to normalize, a pre-MGM opening uh, analysis, a seven-day period from 815 to 822 to evaluate operations following illumination of the sign, and then they're going to look at pre-viaduct reconstruction. They can look at historic crash data, a six-month window from 12-1-2014 to uh, May 31, 2015 that coincides with the same seasonal time period evaluated above. So they'll have three snapshots to look at crash data um, and evaluate whether there's any um, any impact um, resulting from the sign. So we have that process underway to, to engage in that um, study. So I'm sorry for asking a, a fundamental question, but then why would we um, have jurisdiction over this? We, we contemplated a vote here, but what would we be voting on if, according to some of these arguments, I guess, um, it fell under the jurisdiction of the city and they, um, and it appears that they will study it after, afterwards, like the site mind review contemplated. I think if, if all of that logic falls. No, through. I think that's I think that's correct. I think there are many items where that we've talked about in the past where both the commission and the city have jurisdiction over those items for potentially different reasons. You, as the person who approves the final design and the final opening, could weigh in on the sign if you felt that was something you wanted to do. I think what we're trying to do is present to you where that, where that discussion stands now so that you can determine if you want to take action on it. But as the, as the person who issues the final certificate to open, you do have a say in something like the sign. But our say could be, we'll leave it up to the city. I mean, we, we don't have to take yeah. a yes or a no. Yeah, that's correct. Just, Just, were you finished? Jump, money, well, um, unless you, somebody wants to jump in, are you? I'm going to hold till after the presentation yeah. and then hold my questions till then. Right. So, Bruce, did you want to Yeah, let me just have a quick John question finishes. before we move to the presentations. The, uh, the VHB memo that's included in the packet um, on page one under the City of Springfield Zoning Code, um, the last sentence in the last paragraph says, the provisions of the zoning code aim to allow outdoor advertising signs that can be used in a way that communicates important information about MGM Springfield and its special events while not needlessly drawing a driver's attention away from the critical driving task. Is, is that kind of, re is what VHB is saying reflective of what you feel the agreement is with the city and the city council and, and the permits? Yes, um, I, uh, sorry, the answer is yes. And I think when you see the presentation um, of, of the, the video, which Mike will walk us through, you'll see that there's, no, there's certainly ways we could um, utilize animation and video in a way that would be 
um, probably call more attention to our project and be more distracting. I think you'll find that it's, I think some of you saw it on the front side of the property when you're out there, I think you'll find that it's um, tasteful, um, not highly distracting, but, but um, uh, is a way in this modern area to where people are used to moving images all the time to, um, um, to entertain folks and get their, their attention. I mean, the point, the point, we have conflicting um, uh, goals here. The point of a sign is to get someone's attention and, and look at the information on the sign. But we want to do it in a way that's balanced and doesn't needlessly distract. And, and I think we've um, struck that balance, and as you'll see um, in, in, the, in the video that we present in a moment. I'm sorry, did you just say you wanted to entertain folks? Did you, I'm sorry, I, I don't know if I heard the first part of your comment. Yes, yeah, I mean part of- You want to entertain folks while they're driving? We want, we're an entertainment company. We want to reflect that, that there is entertainment at the property and an entertaining sign, it's all about entertainment. Now, you can be entertained, I believe, and not be distracted there, and that's what goes to the, the balance. Actually, never heard anyone talk about being entertained while they drive, but I, I hear what you're saying. Okay. Uh, commissioners, if I can just add, I th and I think going through the, the simulation will be helpful. I think you saw it all live out at the, uh, out, out at the resort is, uh, you know, I, would, I would suggest to you um, that there is static signs that could be very distracting um, and that there is uh, video dynamic signage that could be less distracting. So I think the actual content's important. I know you don't want to be uh, the police of our content. I don't think that's workable. So some of this is, as we've discussed in prior hearings, a little bit of trust in us as operators that have done this um, in many different venues um, across the world uh, on our judgment to uh, safeguard uh, and to strike that right balance. Uh, Seth is right, the point of a sign is to get someone's attention, um, but not so much so that they, that they have an accident. That doesn't help us to have I-91 um, clogged up with accidents beyond what we might do to, to our customers, our employees, our, our community residents. So. Um, I came down here because this is a really important issue for us, um, and we can talk about it um, at, at the conclusion. But I, I, I respect Ombudsman um, Ziemba's concern about the, around this. I know it comes from a sincere concern about public safety. Um, but everything about our project is wow. And I just wanted to make sure that consistent with that, that we were making a case for what we think is an appropriate sign, but also reflects um, the, the standards of our resort and the, and the and the best in class uses of signage as part of the experience. Are you finished, John, to go to the presentation? Or? Yeah, I think that'd be okay. useful. Okay, so you're passing the ball to, to Mike. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, um, and I'll just really briefly s set it up. We've talked about a lot of this already, but back in March, we uh, our March update, we walked through this issue and we had, uh, we explained to you where, where it stood then and what our status and next steps were. And so we talked about um, uh, this sign being exempt generally from MassDOT jurisdiction within the jurisdiction of the city. Uh, the city council approval conditioned on the su uh, submission of the report, which we discussed here today. We submitted that report, the sign permit was issued. Um, so at the time in March, um, you know, when we talked about the status and next steps, um, we, we talked about completion of uh, the sign infrastructure um, that is now complete. We talked about the issuance of the city sign permit that has been issued. Um, we discussed that the digital sign would be in place by July of 2018. The digital sign is in place um, and that the programming was to be determined. We will show you um, in, in a moment um, the programming uh, and that it's subject to uh, further city review once the sign is operational to determine whether additional conditions are required. We've been working collaboratively with the city um, uh, We've kept uh, Mr. Ziemba, Mr. Delaney in the loop on um, what that review looks like, the scope of the study, the information we would gather, and that's what I discussed here today with engaging uh, TEC to um, look at uh, data once it's operational, look at historic data, and look at future data, and do that analysis to determine whether additional conditions are required. Um, so I think we've followed those next steps uh, as we discussed um, several months ago here. And um, with that, I'll turn it over to Mike to um, review with you the programming and how we see this sign um, operating and benefiting the project. Uh, thanks, Seth. Uh, Mike, can you push play? 
So this is a view direct, direct on of our um, iconic sign. It is a combination of uh, dynamic video animation as well as stills. Uh, so I think when you saw it at the resort on the plaza side, uh, you had a sense of how the content would mix. It would be a combination of statics that I think follow the eight second rule mixed in with a, occasional uh, video dynamic. And as you look at this shot, I, I want to follow it up with a video of, of what it actually feels like to drive up 91 because you don't really have this direct view. This is just for your ability to look at the content um, head on. But that is not the view that you have driving, which I think is impactful. Is there in your, in your programming is this thing, is there a, a limit for the length of the moving video? The, these little clips here are quite, quite short. Is that? Is there a limit? Uh, none that we've imposed intentionally, but that's just part of our um, part of our creative process to do short uh, video clips. So if, if that piece of it is important, we can certainly discuss it and, may, and maybe codify that. But I hadn't really thought about that. it until just watching this. But these these video clips, at least that I've seen so far, are so short. This one's actually a little slightly longer. Yeah, I think that motorcycle one is the longest. It's it actually it, it's. It doesn't take much longer than it does to just look at a big billboard. It was just so maybe it would be a lot more of it. I rest, I've been wrestling with this thing all along, and I still am, but it would be a lot more challenging if the video went on while right. you drove all the way by and went past, you know. So uh, from my standpoint, um, if we decide to either don't take a position or to get, do something in favor, limiting it to these short little things is material, just as I watch it now. Yeah, we're happy to voluntarily commit to to, uh, to program it consistent with these durations yeah. if that gives you some comfort. That's what we would do practically anyway. Yeah. But if, if you're looking for a commitment to do that, we're happy to do that. If I can, I just want to show you the actual drive up. In some ways, this is even less dramatic than the WGBH sign we've been talking about because that sign, as you know, is, per is perfectly perpendicular. And you see that sign all the way up the pike. This one, as you approach our resort, is uh, running parallel to the drive. In fact, you almost miss it, which is a little bit of the reason we want some, some interesting content on is to the right there. You may have to replay it because you may have missed it. That's but isn't that part of the issue is it, it will be something that someone will turn their head to look at because it is really inviting and something that isn't common here. I realize it's common in Las Vegas, but it's just not common to drivers here. I, I almost have more concern because of this. Yeah, uh, I'm not a traffic expert, as I know none of us are on this. I, it, there's, there's a few different ways to look at it. I would suggest to you, if you had video staring at you for the whole drive up, that could potentially take your gaze away for more than the two seconds we talked about. Going 60, 70 miles an hour and making that turn that you just described wouldn't last more than two seconds by its very nature. We would hope. We would hope. So, but that's, uh, you know, this is not precedent setting as we've talked about in the past. We do this on the Las Vegas Strip. And I know that's not, um, I know that's not uh, conclusive. We do it on uh, the I-15 highway on the back of the Strip. And it's not even precedent setting within the Commonwealth. As I said this morning, um, we came up the pike, Seth and I, and WGBH sign had crashing waves against a shoreline that was staring at us all the way up. Um, the most distracting part of it was us feverishly trying to grab a video clip to show the commission. <laughs> but, so, but after many, many years of having the sign there, that people are accustomed to that sign now, I think is part of the issue here. Well, they started somewhere at WGBH, but they, right? But, but yeah. without any very static. The, the agreement was to have static when that sign opened. And how many years? Many years, John. We talked about that. 2007. What, what do you have on I-15? We have, uh, we have dynamic signage on the back of the Mandalay Bay and some of our other resorts. For example, I think there's a shark tank. We have the, the shark tank, which is a world famous aquarium. And it's got the shark um, um, swimming through the water, for example. Mm -hmm. So um, I tasked my folks in, in Clark County um, that work with Clark County on the development side. We have, uh, we have ex extremely uh, dynamic signage on the Las Vegas Boulevard, including um, one of the neatest signs I've ever saw is from one of our competitors, Win, that, and I know Bob's here that can talk about this, that has a moving bar that actually goes up and down mechanically and reveals video 
um, as it moves. But that's on the Las Vegas Strip, and I wanted to make sure that from a highway perspective, which I know is a little bit different because you're moving faster, we also have the same thing on I-15, which sees you know millions and millions of cars each year as busy as uh, I-91, and we have video on the back of those ginormous, uh, um, very large screens as well. So there's precedent in our industry, uh, and they continue to approve them in Clark County. Uh, and there's also precedent now in, in the Commonwealth. So uh, I, was, I was, with 10 days left, we're obviously really judicious about our time and, and the kinds of things that we want to talk to you about. But I was walking the property, I think, three days ago, and a construction worker stopped me and said, hey, Mr. Mathis, I just got to let you know, because they were working in the plaza and seeing the signage that you saw, that there's something wrong with your loop. Um, the highway doesn't have any of that, any of this material that we're seeing in the plaza, and you know the public should see it. It's great. Um, it just looks like a billboard out there, and, and that's what really concerns me. Is anybody that feels like anything is just at our property? We've got really creative folks that provided, I think, really interesting content that highlights all the non. As you saw, there's bowling highlighted there, Indian motorcycle. It's all the great non-gaming retail that we've always bragged about and want to get people excited about, and it's not just gaming. So uh, we, we have the highest standards in everything we do, and that includes signage and marketing, and, and I think this uh, package that we presented to you is reflective of that, and I want to fight for it. Mike, are you, are you aware of what signage you might be have uh, MGM employees in Detroit? I mean, I always kind of closely relate the Springfield project to your project in Detroit. Do you happen to have an idea of what signage Yeah, you know, uh, we didn't look at that. I mean, I think part of the distinction with Detroit is it's, it's, on, it's on the surface streets and not, on, not directly on the highway. Um, mm -hmm. So that's why I try to draw analogies to I-15 in Las Vegas. And then, again, the WGBH, I thought that would be more relevant. I, we, I didn't look at, um, at that jurisdiction. Plus, that jurisdiction is a city-by-city um, standard. So again, that's why I thought the highway one was more relevant. I, I did check with New Jersey because as you come into Atlantic City, all the billboards, they are required to uh, utilize state standards there because they are actual billboards coming into Atlantic City and they, they're total advertisements for the casinos. Right. But, but, but they do the adhere to the state sites. standards. Right. You mean the eight second steel image? Correct. Standard. Ours is 10. New Jersey, I don't know if they use the federal eight standard or if they have a different standard, but they are required to use state standards. If I could add one more point, because it came up in the discussion with the city uh, and, and TEC, um, one of the opportunities that we miss by not turning this on now is the ability to look at, um, to look at data when the sign is on dynamic. Um, prior to our increased traffic that our project generates. And um, that is a, whether that's relevant, relevant, but that's certainly a data point that this, that um, city solicitor Pakula thought would be important to collect and requested that when we outline our study, we look at that. And in the proposal I have for, from TEC, they would certainly look at that to see, because we do expect to increase traffic flows on 91. And so um, it is a, we'll, we'll forever lose the opportunity to look at pre-opening um, uh, impact, um, if any, and see if, uh, and that will be a relevant data point to determine whether, in fact, there is um, uh, impact um, from the sign with lower traffic flows versus uh, um, higher traffic flows. And so that's one of the reasons we want to, say, flip the switch now and then be able to look at that data um, in the next two weeks. But what about that argument um, that Commissioner Cameron makes about the a custom, the, the 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 factor of getting people used to something um, that's not all new, which appears to be the case at, on the WGBH example, that they they turn it more dynamic after there's enough familiarity with the property. Uh, I I mean that is a um, we understand that point. We think that the um, um, we think that the combination of static with the, as, as I think when we watched the video um, showing the sign, um, it was tasteful. I, I don't, I mean, I'm advocating for the company, so my view, I don't find it um, distracting. Um, I, I think that um, if we, we may want to have more wow down the road, I think we struck a balance of saying, let's early on make it very, um, um, 
very limited um, to ensure an abundance of caution that that there is it, it's not dis, um, distracting and um, so it's it's a fair point um, but we're, we're confident that um, the way it is now um, as we're proposing it um, is um, strikes that balance I, I just have a, a couple of concerns one being and the chairman brought this up you really said we don't have any standards and now I just heard we want more Wow down the road so I do have I, I do have a real concern that you know there are no standards here you can do as much video as you want and you really can't assure us that there's anything built in to keep it safe um, I know it's it's hard to do that but um, you know and I'm really concerned the th first three months are when there are so many people coming, so many people excited, and we also uh, are invested in you having a great opening, and, and a couple of major crashes um, will not help. So I, I, I guess I just really struggle, and I, I typically don't like to, um, you know, step on the toes of, of, of the city, but I, I do have real concerns here about this from a public safety standpoint. And um, I think a lot of work has been done by, you know, um, federal and state um, agencies who really understand this business and they have standards for a reason. Um, and I, I understand this isn't quite an off-site, but even in your own literature, as, as John pointed out, um, you know, most have done this voluntarily because they don't want to distract drivers. Um, I actually think if you popped every, you know, eight seconds, it would be very, um, uh, attracting it without having that distraction of a video. Um, I just, it, it's not something we're accustomed to here and I really do have concerns uh, about the safety and particularly the first three months. I'm concerned that, okay, we're going to study it in three months, but you know, if there are a couple of major crashes uh, in those three months, um, that's, that's, that is not the good thing to open by. Are you, are you um, suggesting, Commissioner, that, that um, you might be open to doing it after the crunch is over? If we, if we went, say, pick a date, 90 days, that at that point you'd be willing to reconsider? Uh, well, I, I would love to see. I would love to, again, the study would be important to me, what happens for those first three months, even if it's eight, eight seconds uh, of, of a static dynamic display. I mean, those, those, are, those are impressive. But, yeah, I really am. Um, I, I think the video is eye-catching, and you want to see what happens. The, the bowling, it goes up, and oh, there are beers in there, and you know, you just want to see that. Um, so I, I do have concerns, and I, I, I just think to open it, to, to allow it, and then study it is, is kind of the cart before the, the horse here. But that's what the city approved. I understand. I understand that. But I, as that's we one of the hard issues out, for me is that, you know, we have, we've typically been very deferential to the cities, and I know you're, yes. you respect this as well. I know you're as torn as mm -hmm. we all are on this, but um, if, if the, it, 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 it's, I, yesterday I felt like I was going to vote, if, if we have, I'm not even sure we should really be voting on this in a way, because the city has more expertise than we do, it's, you know, I don't really, but if we were to make a decision, I was going to say that I thought, hey, there's, on, on highway signage, which is not part of a, of a company, neither the, any jurisdiction that I can find, including Nevada, I had John look up Nevada, um, or the Outdoor Advertising Board itself, with the exception of entertainment districts in the Outdoors mm -hmm. Advertising Board, which is kind of a strange exception, none of the potential regulatory agencies or even the industry association suggests or permits um, moving signs. I know. And so I was thinking, and okay, so why would we want to be first here? On the other hand, um, there's, there's, as everybody agrees, there's no evidence affirmatively one way or the other. I mean, or if there's mixed evidence both ways, there's no way that you can draw a conclusion um, as to whether this is a problem or not. And the city is probably more invested in it than we are. They're, gonna, they're the ones who approved it. They're going to take more flack than we are if there's an issue. They, they approved it with a study. Um, so now I, I'm thinking, you know, and, and on, honestly, for what it's worth, to the extent that your own, one's own judgment makes any difference, you know, it, 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 
doesn't strike me as any more distracting than some of those incredible big videos, big uh, digital signs on Southeast Expressway. So I, you know, I end up, um, and there is the precedent, which is worth something, you know, that, that uh, the regulatory agencies around here and, and the communities, apparently even BRA, don't have their hair on fire because of the evolution of the GBH thing. So I, I'm, I kind of lean all things considered to su supporting the city, maybe strengthening it a little bit, you know. Um, I thought of two things. One would be to permit it only during non-rush hours, um, and but also to make sure that there were, but I think there are deadlines in, in calling for the studies, but I, I kind of lean towards, um, given the complete paucity of any data one way or the other, and that we're all just using our sort of common sense and anecdotal experience that we probably ought to go with the city and let them yeah. figure and, it out. And, uh, you know, I think the city has a lot of um, expertise, but I don't know that highway signage is one of them. I think that's the state's expertise, and they have clearly weighed in. Yeah. If I could just um, yeah. give my thoughts. Um, for me, the, the question of whether this falls under the jurisdiction of outdoor advertising or not, um, in terms of a public safety question, is a distinction without a difference for me. This is sort of a loophole that's been out there in terms of regulating on-site billboard advertising. To me, I'm informed by looking at the industry standards and then looking at what are the state standards for safety. And with all due respect to the city, I do think this is more of a highway safety issue. Um, when you look at the fact that the industry says, stay away from dynamic, and if you're going to do them in other circumstances, you know, if you're gonna roll from one static to another, you know, stick with between eight to 10. Um, I had a very different reaction. I did think it was a distracting video, entertaining, but distracting. Um, and, a, and a distinction between this and the GBH sign, in addition to GBH starting slowly, um, people getting used to it, it being easier to see without having to turn, they still don't have telephone numbers. They still don't have wording, et cetera. And quite a bit of yours um, do, in fact, do that because you're trying to draw people in. And so on balance, to me, I do think we have jurisdiction in terms of our oversight of the license and the premises. Uh, I think when you look at industry standards and I think when you look at what this is doing, I think in the interest of public safety, starting slower, making sure that three, six months that even you and the city acknowledge would not be an appropriate time to test, pushing anything over the balance to risk any sort of driver distraction to me is not a prudent choice. Um, so to the extent that we are voting in our over jurisdiction that overlaps somewhat with the city, um, I would not be inclined to allow that sign in that location to have dynamic images. Just to be clear, I don't disagree that we have authority. We can actually, we absolutely have the right to speak to this. Whether we want to or not is a question, but we absolutely have the right, no question about it. Or have the authority. Other people's sort of general comments? Yeah, I, um, I, I was somewhat concerned, uh, in obviously, reviewing the material, looking at the two examples that they use. What's interesting about the two examples that you use is that I'm not familiar with the Clark County signs, but the GBH sign and the Hall of Fame side actually face the oncoming traffic. I think what you showed from the video is that you really don't have a clear view of what the message is on the sign until you're almost on top of it. Um, you know, I, I would even suspect I'd feel differently if maybe there was something along the south side of your parking garage that was something that somebody had a longer chance to view as they were driving up. Um, you know, I, I, and, and like the chairman, I'm certainly, you know, uh, sensitive to this balance between what the city's authority is and, again, what our authority is. Um, but I do go back to what BHB talked about in reviewing the city's provisions is that they definitely want to allow MGM to provide information about special events. However, again, they say, while not needlessly drawing a driver's attention away from the critical driving task. And some of those images, to me, would distract me. Would, and again, you know, a moving image as I'm going by it, and it's over to my right as opposed to right in front of me, uh, I would consider that a distraction. I, I certainly would feel comfortable saying, start with the eight second or 10 second intervals, but try not to, again, have a dynamic message that flashes something or moves something that might distract a driver as they're going by. 
I just, it, it's feels. I mean, if I were if I were NGM, I'd be sitting there thinking, well, let's rebuild our sign and make it horizontal, <laughs> and they'll be in favor of it. Which seems weird to me that that we would be encouraging them to put up a big horizontal sign, but. But again, just going back to the examples they're sharing, they're not something that's. But there aren't any other examples. That's the problem. There's no. There's very little data out there. That's well, maybe the, there's I, a reason for that, though. Yeah. You know, you're talking about driving at high speeds in vehicles. I mean, that might not be the best spot for it. Mr. Zuniga, do you have a? Yeah. No. I. Um, I. I tend to see the other. The other aspect. I think um, some of the moving images. I mean, if a wheel is rotating, it's. Sure, it's moving, but it's not necessarily, I don't know, creating something that, that really distracts. I mean, you can get a glance at a moving wheel and, or, or a bowling ball that's going to get to, a, to the end of a, a bowling table that happens to have beers, and you, know, you can kind of expect what's, what's happening. Um, so I, I, I do get the, the, the point about if, if, if all we're talking about is the moving image being what puts us over the edge. I can see why the content, which is hard to get into from, from our perspective, is, is just a slippery slope. And, 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 and I'd rather, in, in that case, defer to the city. I do, see, I do see, and you make very compelling arguments towards safety and the notion of, um, at least perhaps initially, to have some real adherence to, um, to the standard, to the extent that we can program and, and, and try to strike that. You can try to strike that balance between drawing people in and complying with the standard. And as data becomes, begins to you know, accumulate, or, or, or at least uh, the drivers are get, get accustomed to it, uh, maybe the issue about you know, being to the side or not is consequential or not consequential, and we can, we can then uh, have, have data to go, go with. So perhaps in the interest of uh, consensus, I'll go along with that. I'm, I'm, I was initially thinking, like you, Mr. Chairman, that um, if the city approved this and, 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 and people are comfortable with it, I would go along. Um, but apparently, there seems to be a, a, a majority emerging already. And I would rather then um, encourage uh, MGM to, to think about whatever uh, they can do to comply with the standard as it is and begin to accumulate data to continue the requirements in the site plan review. It feels to me like that most of us are fairly close, whichever side of the issue we're on. Um, would it be um, acceptable to, if we said, let's not, let's not permit it for either 90 days or whenever DOT tells us traffic is back to its pre-opening norms. I mean, I'm sure they have traffic counts and they know, you know when we've gotten through whatever the mass increase. So 90 days or later, if whenever the traffic is back to a norm, and at that point, we would reconsider this um, and with no predetermined outcome, but at least a commitment that say we will take another look at this once we're through the crunch period. Commissioners, can I just add one data point? And I feel compelled uh, because I just got this message from Councillor uh, Pakua, who's a uh, uh, representative, obviously, of Springfield. And I will just say exactly what it says. I am sending a letter of approval for the plan. It is being typed now. Our Office of Plan and Economic Development is the approving authority. Ed Pakua, city solicitor. It was uh, sent to me at 10:59, so two minutes ago. I'm not. In, I'm just a data point. That's all. Um, in, if I could, um, you know, as we were listening to this discussion, I certainly, as Mike said, we fully respect the concerns. We understand that this is a tricky issue, and, I, and I've been trying to figure out why, why the the gaming commission and the city seem to be on different pages on this issue. And I think the other factor about this sign that we haven't talked about, and one of the benefits to it is, is the revitalization of Springfield. And what we're doing in Springfield and the desire of the city to bring people to the area and have people drive by and feel like there's a vibe, there's something exciting going on in Springfield. And I think that's part of what this sign represents and is doing, is somewhat of a beacon to people that come to Springfield 
come experience not only MGM, but what's going on in Springfield. And I think that's really why the city um, and the folks in the city are supportive of giving us the opportunity to do this because um, they want to see those folks come drive by, not necessarily read the message on the sign, but say, wow, there's something, this is, we don't see this anywhere else. We see it in Boston, the WGGB sign, and now we see one in Springfield, and there's something going on here. And I, and I think that is why, and why I would suggest deferring to the jurisdiction of the city to, to allow us to do that um, makes sense, and um, why there's probably some, and I know you all want us to be success, successful, but um, I think it represents not just us, but the, the, the residents in the community um, being excited about bringing people and feeling like there's something new and exciting in Springfield. Um, so I, I, I just, that's my opinion on why there's somewhat of a d difference between the city uh, and the commission on this issue. Um, but I think it's an important factor. You know, I, I, as I said, I would, I'm very reluctant to override the city, but I, I see, I think at this point, it looks like if, if we have probably three people who are prepared to vote against doing this, um, would, would one or more of you be acceptable to the idea of committing that we will rethink this come either 90 days or whenever the traffic has hit post-opening norms with, with no promises, simply saying that's the worst concern is that period of time we will look at this again in that in some period of time. I, I think we certainly can look at it again. I'm just not sure that three months is, is enough time um, to um, have enough data. I'm just... Data on? Uh, on uh, the roadway and, and crashes and anything else that may be going on out there. So I just, I'm just a little concerned about the time. time. Not that I don't want to revisit, but just I'm just not sure. I think the three months only came from the city I, I just don't know. I would defer to uh, our traffic uh, experts of what the appropriate amount of time is to, to, to study something like this to have uh, enough data to be uh, worthwhile. Well, I don't know what that would be, but I think that an important marker that was indicated by MGM itself was December 1st identified. Okay. Uh, was it was a date by which they thought that most of the traffic would subside. What would be necessary after that date? would certainly be an important consideration. But um, uh, if the commission were amenable to doing that, we could certainly c consider something mm -hmm. at about that time. If there's not enough data, then we could we could okay. postpone whatever review you wanted to do if the commission yep. chooses to go in that direction. That would be appropriate. So we, we have a presumption of three months, but not an absolute commitment. Are you OK with that, Commissioner? Yeah, that, that I would totally. Commissioner oh, Scott, sorry. Commissioner O'Brien, would you be okay? Okay with that. Okay. Um, somebody want to put that into a, a motion? Commissioner Zinnica, you well, I was going to. Um, I was going to move. I was going to vote against it. So I'd, I'd rather not. <laughs> oh, you're going to vote against opposing yeah. it with the, the commitment yes. to be thinking. Oh, okay. Yes. Well, I was going to go along with everybody to be buddy here. So, so anybody want to frame? I'm going to vote in favor of this. So does anybody want to frame that? <laughs> Articulate. You want to do it. Are we taking this in stages and saying there's a vote on the request to go dynamic at present, or are we deferring? What I was suggesting, and, and we can do whatever we want, what I was suggesting is that we vote to not permit the motion sign, but also commit to reconsidering that in 90 days, unless for some reason we decide well, not to. If we break those votes, I'll vote for the second one. Okay, whatever. I mean, I mean we'll, we'll, it looks like if I vote for it, we'll win. If it's, it'll, it'll pass if it's won, but we might have a consensus if it's. I, I don't care. I mean, I'll, I'll move, and you can tell me whether I'm summarizing what you're looking for, um, <laughs> Mr. Chair. I would move that the commission um, deny uh, any request to have static movement in the sign identified and discussed earlier um, by the representatives of MGM currently present. Um, without prejudice, um, such that in 90 days we can revisit the issue of whether we'll, there will be dynamic images allowed on the sign referenced. That's what I was looking for. Second. Thank you. We want to make that 90 days from post-open. 90 days post-open. 
Uh, so I had a second uh, for the discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 I went along. Okay. Yeah. Uh, opposed is nobody, so that vote is passed unanimously. And just to clarify, that was no dynamic movement. No dynamic. Right. 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 We know which is still stands. Yes, exactly. Right. right. I just buy it for the record. Right. Just, right. right. Okay. Is that? And then I guess the so the uh, intent of the commission then is that they would follow current standards as they should follow outdoor advertising highway standards. Okay. Which is the eight seconds? Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Which is what the video followed, I think. That was changing every eight seconds. Mm -hmm. Okay. And whatever whatever the research this is just, you know, casual, but whatever research of usage now, usage during that ninety day period, whatever research you think that might be constructive to help us make decisions, um, please go with it. I know you've been talking to TDC about doing something, but maybe they can rethink a methodology that will give us, help give us some kind of data that makes us, we, that we can use in our next round. Okay, anything else on this topic or your update? No, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. I'm going to have a quick adjournment. We'll be back with the Red <laughs> Yes, we're ready to reconvene public meeting 250, and we are at item number four, the Investigations and Enforcement Bureau. Uh, Loretta Lilios. Hi. Good morning. Uh, the IEB is here to ask you to consider a request made by our licensee, Plainville Gaming and Redevelopment and its parent company, Penn National Gaming. Uh, specifically, they have asked the commission to grant interim authorization to, to allow it to close on October 1st of this year on a planned real estate in transaction. The real estate involved is the real estate located at the Plain Ridge Park Casino, the gaming facility in Plainville, and you have a report in your packet as well as a chart, chart A, that details the transaction. There are uh, representatives from the, the two parties to the plan transaction that are here uh, today. Uh, Attorney uh, Albano sitting at the table uh, today represents uh, both parties. Uh, we have uh, Frank Donahue, uh, Justin Sebastiano, and Stephen O'Toole. Uh, from Penn and Brandon Moore from the other party, Gaming uh, and Leisure Properties Incorporated. And I would like to just say from the outset that uh, all of uh, the parties and these individuals have been uh, extremely helpful to the IEB over the past uh, couple of months uh, in their responsiveness and forthcomingness uh, have really assisted us uh, in understanding uh, the transaction that's described in your report and that I'll touch on uh, this morning. Uh, so as detailed in the report, uh, PGR, our licensee, has entered into a purchase and sale agreement with Gaming and Leisure Properties Incorporated, whereby GLPI will acquire the real estate associated with PPC, uh, the casino, for $250 million. And PGR, our licensee, would then sublease the property at PPC through subsidiaries as shown on chart A uh, in your report. And the subsidiaries are uh, Pinnacle MLS on the Penn side and Gold Merger Sub on the GLPI side. The rent payable under the lease would be a $25 million flat rate annually. And the lease with all of its renewal options exercised would run to April of 2051. Uh, under this arrangement, PGR would remain an indirect, wholly owned subsidiary of Penn. PGR would continue to hold the Category 2 gaming license, and PGR would continue to be the operator of PPC. Our gaming law requires that this real estate transaction be approved by the Commission, and our regulations uh, state that there are two stages to this approval process interim authorization, and then final approval. We're before you now on the interim authorization piece. The IEB conducted an initial investigation in accordance with the regulations. As a first step in this process, we scoped out the transaction and identified uh, six entities and six individuals to go through the qualification process. Uh, that is outlined on pages two and three of the report. 
two of the companies that we identified and five of the six individuals previously went through the qualification process with the commission and were found suitable uh, before. And this uh, investigation refreshed those background reviews. A little background on GLPI, um, which would be the landlord and purchaser of the real estate at PPC. Uh, GLPI is a publicly traded company known as a Real Estate Investment Trust, or a REIT. GLPI was spun off from Penn National and incorporated in February of 2013. It has elected to be taxed as a REIT, and as such, it's required to adhere to a number of uh, internal revenue code rules and Treasury Department rules. And some of the features of REITs and some of those essential rules are also outlined in the, in the report. GLPI is in the business of acquiring, financing, and owning real estate property that is then leased back to gaming operators. And the leases require that the operators remain responsible for all operating expenses, real estate taxes, and capital expenditures. The agreement between GLPI and uh, uh, Penn to sell PPC's real estate to GLPI is one in a series of planned and interrelated transactions that are scheduled to take place immediately before, simultaneously with or immediately after. Uh, um, the transaction involving PPC. The most significant of the transactions uh, is Penn's uh, planned acquisition of Pinnacle Entertainment. Uh, Pinnacle is another regional operator, um, and the result of the transaction will be that in the aggregate, uh, Penn will acquire the gaming operations of 12 facilities across the United States and sell the real estate for PPC and GLPI will acquire the property assets of PPC and one other casino in Ohio. Uh, Trooper Tom Roger and Financial Investigation Supervisor Monica Cheng worked on this investigation, uh, and I did want to uh, uh, draw to your attention that uh, despite a, a heavy workload at the moment, there was knowledge that there's a planned closing date uh, in the fall for this transaction, and they uh, made it happen without sacrificing the uh, quality or scope of the investigation. I would like to ask uh, Monica to comment on some of the uh, anticipated impacts of the series of transactions on Penn. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Um, so as explained by Penn and together with Pinnacle through their joint press release, um, the the impact of the planned transactions is expected to be favorable. So operationally, the combined company will uh, the combined companies will increase in scale through addition of the Pinnacle properties to Penn's portfolio, um, which allows them to uh, have greater economies of scale and also increase purchasing power. The um, geographically diverse but complementary properties will allow Penn to um, expand its footprint. Uh, both geographic, um, both regionally, sorry, but also to new states. Um, the combined uh, customer base uh, of the two companies, which is estimated to be around five million in active players, that will give rise to promotional and also uh, marketing opportunities for Penn. Uh, financially, uh, the diversification of uh, the added properties uh, will translate to financial stability. Um, also increase in free cash flow and also generation of cost synergies. Um, the accretion of the free cash flow will be uh, used to um, have Penn service their long-term debt as part of this acquisition. And concurrently, the, the uh, cost synergies of the expected um, 100 million a year, um, that will be generated at the both the corporate level and the operate, uh, operational level of the properties, either through the reduction uh, or elimination of uh, corporate redundancies, but also improving operational efficiencies at the property level. Um, so after the announcement um, and the press release uh, of this planned transaction, uh, the stock of both companies went up. So that just suggests uh, market confidence in the overall transaction. So. One of the components of this planned transaction, um, specifically uh, the scope of our uh, interim authorization, is the, the PPC real estate asset sell lease back to, to GLPI. Um, that can be seen as a source of financing for Penn, 
uh, but also um, a long-term investment for GLPI. Um, so the proposed long-term um, lease obligation, so that establishes a fixed 25 million in annual rental payment from PPC, um, but that 25 million translates to a stable inflow of cash um, in the form of rental income for GLPI. Um, so as we've seen uh, through this interim um, review, GLPI's uh, financial results have been improving since their spin-off in 2013, so uh, the addition of the PBC real estate sell lease back um, will just supplement that growth. So overall, the, um, the impact um, of the transactions um, have been well received by both uh, Penn uh, and Pinnacle shareholders, but also um, through the public. Um, I just want to reiterate that as part of this interim um, authorization and review, the investigators, we focused on uh, this uh, PPC sell lease back um, transaction and the related qualifiers that were scoped in. Uh, as a continuation of this suitability investigation uh, that will allow us to um, the opportunity to verify, um, further evaluate, and then conclude on the general impact that, that, I, that I talked about today. Uh, but more importantly, to really um, affirm the transaction details once everything finalizes and approves and, and signed off, which will be um, later, later this year. So also as part of, um, thank you Monica, as part of this initial investigation, the IEB, as I mentioned, uh, had ongoing communications uh, with, the, with the parties. We reviewed the submissions from each of the qualifiers. We conducted uh, criminal record checks in accordance with our usual protocol. We verified licensing and suitability status of GLPI in the various, license, uh, various jurisdictions uh, where it has under, undergone that kind of review. We reviewed the lease terms for the PPC REIT transaction, considered the litigation status of each entity qualifier, performed research through a number of uh, uh, law enforcement and public databases, performed uh, initial financial reviews uh, for each qualifier. Uh, we evaluated the qualifiers and the transaction based upon the standards set forth in 205 CMR 116.105, and which provide that the commission may approve interim authorization, allowing the real estate transaction to close if it finds that eight criteria have been met. And those eight criteria are discussed on pages 22 to 24 of the report. Um, first of all, the qualifiers did submit completed forms, licensing division, verified the submissions and the IEB also confirmed the completed submissions were made from each qualifier. A copy of the uh, trust, uh, which is required by the regulation, was submitted to the commission. The commission approved the Plain Ridge nominee trust on June 21st. That trust, uh, as you uh, may recall, uh, provides that if there is a suitability issue that arrives arises after interim authorization is allowed, then the commission uh, may order that the PPC uh, property uh, return uh, to um, uh, back into the trust or to PGR. And if there is a suitability issue at the final determination stage, the property uh, goes back to PGR. So essentially there is a provision uh, that could unwind the whole transaction as it has to do with our licensee uh, in the event of a suitability issue. Uh, the, the regulations also require a background review for the trustee of the trust, uh, Mr. Timothy Wilmot, who's the chief executive officer and a director at Penn, uh, is the trustee. He went through suitability already in the initial uh, stages of the license that was issued. Uh, back in 2013-2014. Uh, uh, a report on his background appears as Exhibit 8 in your packet. Uh, Mr. Wilmot has a long history in gaming, uh, started out in Harris, uh, joined Penn in 2013, uh, and uh, he's licensed in, in many jurisdictions, and the uh, IAB recommends a suitability finding on him that he's established suitability by clear and convincing evidence. Um, 
Another factor uh, has to do with our initial review of suitability for all of the qualifiers, and I can state that after the review that we performed, uh, that we uncovered no information uh, that undermines a suitability uh, finding. But of course, as we move to the final stage, uh, we will uh, do supplemental uh, review, supplemental information will be reviewed, and we'll do a full suitability invest. Uh, in addition, the invest that we've conducted indicates that the transaction involving PPC will result only in the transfer of the real property. Um, the licensee will remain the same, and GLPI, by all the terms of the lease and all of the federal rules that it has to comply with, uh, by all indications, will remain a passive landlord uh, in the situation. Uh, another. Uh, regulatory requirement that has been met is that each of the qualifiers certified in writing under the pains and penalties of perjury that they're unaware of any derogatory information that could undermine suitability. Uh, and ultimately, um, it, the uh, IEB's information is that allowing the transaction to close now would be in the best interest of the Commonwealth in terms of allowing an uninterrupted flow of tax revenues and continued employment of the uh, individuals who are uh, employees of, of PPC uh, at the moment. <clears throat> uh, also, by uh, all of the information that we have reviewed, uh, there's no change in control uh, at the facility now. Again, operator uh, remains, <clears throat> remains the same. Uh, should the Commission approve interim authorization for the sale of the real estate now, the closing uh, may take place. <clears throat> And the IEB would continue with its final investigation, which under the regulations uh, must be completed uh, within a year. And there is a <clears throat> racing component to this uh, that I believe uh, tracks um, the, uh, uh, the analysis that we've given you and given in the report. Uh, Catherine may wish to uh, speak to that in more detail. So, Commissioners, in your packet, you have a letter that um, meets the qualifications of 128A Section 11C. It is a similar process to that which we used when tra Suffolk Downs transferred its property. I have reviewed the letter. They meet the requirements of 128A, so we should be okay with transferring the racing part of this property as part of this overall transfer. If, if the commissioners have any questions, and certainly the parties are here uh, directly to address anything uh, that you may, you may have. Um. I, I note that we're the 11th jurisdiction to look at this matter, to review the matter uh, without any issues elsewhere. Very well prepared report, certainly no issues. I did, uh, my one question was a separate letter um, to Dr. Lightbaum uh, requesting approval from the racing division, and I see the Penn Racing folks are here. So I'm sure that's to assure us that there would be no um, disruption. Uh, of racing operations or integrity with this, with this sale. Um, so I just uh, obviously we have authority over the racing division, so that's within our jurisdiction. Um, but yeah, other than that, really clean and see no reason why we wouldn't approve this. Uh, yeah, no, I, I thank you for those uh, that summary and the report. It's uh, it's really thoughtful and well um, well written. Um, I, I'm familiar with these transactions. I think, it's, as you pointed out, um, uh, Director, um, they're very economical. They make sense, um, and it's in the benefit of both uh, uh, Penn and GLPI, and, 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 and as a consequence of, of PPC. I do have a couple of questions. I suspect the answer might be the same for those questions of, of the of the Penn folks, perhaps Mr. Albano or others. Um, I, um, there's, are, are there any provisions in the lease or remedies um, if, say, Penn or PPC in this case is not awarded a license after the end of this license towards that, um, that payment? I know Penn guarantees the payment to GLPI going forward regardless of, the, um, of what happens. But are there any provisions uh, that allow Penn to renegotiate a lease, for example, with, with GLPI? May I defer to Mr. Moore? Sure. Uh, the 
lucky straw, I think. Um, so Brandon Moore, I'm general counsel of gaming and leisure properties. And so the question with respect to the lease, if I understand it correctly, is if Penn National Gaming, the affiliate of Penn National Gaming, were to not be relicensed, what would happen under the lease? Mm -hmm. The way the lease is structured is there, it's a unitary lease, so you're right in the sense that there's no individual rent property by property. However, there is a provision in the lease, it's section 14 point, it's in section eight and then in 14.6, 14.6 will provide that if Penn were to lose a license for something that's a reason outside of the control, so for instance in Iowa, Shortly after the lease was put in effect, the Iowa property in Sioux City was, the license was, was ended and it went to a new party. The provision in the lease provides that if a license is lost in that situation, there is a reduction in rent. So we will reduce their rent by a prescribed formula in the event of a loss of a license. Um, and, and that's in the lease as it stands today in both the Penn lease and the Pinnacle lease, which is what this property will be a part of. Okay. Now, um, what happens, you, you mentioned that the rent is not um, conceived as, as, as a property by property, but there's a, there's a rent number associated with PPC, in this case, the 25 million. Is there, what, what happens if the property cannot, quote unquote, afford the rent payment going forward? So under the master lease, which this will be a part of, Penn would still have to pay the rent. So we, we have decided between us and Penn that the contribution to the base rent under that Pinnacle lease would be $25 million for our acquisition of the land and building associated with the Plain Ridge property. But if for some reason, say, there was a snowstorm or a flood or I don't know what it might be there, I don't know what the geography is that would cause some sort of cessation of the operations, the rent would still be due. So, so that's the way those leases are structured, and presumably the support from all the other facilities that go into that lease would support that payment of rent. So unless there was a situation where the lease was terminated, the doors were closed, the lights were shut off, um, there would be no interruption in the rent stream. Now, there could be at the end of the rent term, it gets a little hairy and when we get into the lease dynamics, and, and this property is a flat contribution of rent. The other properties have a percentage rent component, so that there was a deterioration in the operations there because of competition or something else, they would conceivably get a rent adjustment downward every two years under that Pinnacle lease. And, and it's designed to just make sure that the operator stays healthy. Oh, t tell me more about that. I, I didn't quite realize that was the case. So, so th when we structure the master lease, there are a number of properties in that lease. There are three basic components to the rent under all of our master leases, which is a base rent that never changes, a building base rent, a land base rent that's set up front that doesn't change, and then there's a percentage rent component that you do a look back under the Penn Master Lease, it's every five years, under the Pinnacle Master Lease, that this would be a part of, it's every two years. And you look at the net revenues over that two-year period, and the rent can go up or down based on, on the success of the facilities during that period. When we looked at the Plain Ridge property, because there are new properties coming into the state and other factors, both we and Penn agreed that we wouldn't have a percentage rent piece to this. We'll pick a number. We'll put it in as a flat base rent, and we've also excluded it from some of the other calculations under the lease so that it doesn't go into those calculations. So um, th that's just a function of the negotiation between the parties of saying, let's just, let's just pick a number, put it in, and we'll keep it aside. And so in, in the lease, when you see it in the lease, you won't see Plain Ridge 25 million you'll see in addition to the base rent under that Pinnacle lease of 25 million that reflects our acquisition of the Plain Ridge property and its addition to our portfolio. So the increase or the decrease in revenues component is uh, one that the parties look at in the aggregate? In the aggregate, that's right. And, and the, every, two, every two years. Because Plain Ridge won't be part of that. But it doesn't apply to Plain Ridge. It doesn't because yeah, right. it's, it's exempt from that yes. feature. It's exempt from that feature. That's exactly right. Okay. I hadn't thought about this before, but when in the event that the license for Penn National at Plainville was not renewed uh, and was awarded s to somebody else, what, how would the transaction between GLPI and the somebody else work? So the way that it's structured in the lease, and we haven't encountered this, so I can't tell you, in, in the Iowa example I gave, that license was actually awarded to somebody else that built a brand new facility that wasn't on our property. So we had no part of that. It, it, in the situation that I think you're, you're suggesting where if Penn were to lose the lease, but you recognize that that facility, which is <clears throat> designed and built for gaming, 
and somebody else could step in and run those machines on day one. So you don't have a two-year period to build a new facility or something like that. And we were to enter into a new lease. What, what the lease provides is that we, what we would do is enter into a new lease with the, with the new tenant, whoever that was going to be, under substantially similar terms to the lease we have now. Now, there is a, a rub here where, and it gets into the business negotiation between the parties. If the problem is that the rent was too high, then the whole lease is in jeopardy. And I think we find ourselves at Gaming and Leisure Properties faced with the notion of if the rent construct is too high, then we're probably going to be forced to renegotiate rental rental payments and those sorts of things. But again, we haven't encountered that today. Right. But we, the, the we, case, I'm thinking more, it, just for the record, this is an utterly hypothetical, OK? Sure. But it's not an, it's not, it is a hypothetical that I think is worth thinking about. If we were not satisfied with the performance of Penn National um, and we decided to rebid um, and uh, give opportunity to somebody else to come in and, and bid, and somebody else came in and bid, um, and I'm asking this, actually, I'm asking this of you, but I'd like to have you think about this as well, and Loretta, wherever you went, you know, are we compromised, or is the commission compromised in its ability to make an objective decision based on the leverage that GLPI has on a new license holder? I mean, if you make life miserable for the new license holder in terms of how you'll rent to them, does that put us at a disadvantage in being able to be objective um, in assessing whether or not Penn National is indeed the best operator? So from our perspective at GLPI, we don't think so. Um, we believe that we're kind of at your mercy. So obviously, you control ultimately whether or not gaming happens at that location, that property. There is no better use presently at that property. The highest and best use is undoubtedly gaming. So we are a little bit at your mercy in the sense that you have to license a tenant. That tenant has to choose that facility that we own to conduct their gaming in. And if they don't, then we have a very expensive facility that the next best use, the rent that will be derived, I can only surmise will be substantially lower than the rent we'll generate today. Um, and, and I will say we also view ourselves as a bit of a partner to the state in the sense that our interest as a triple net landlord is for the lights to be on and the machines to be running at all time. To the extent that that doesn't happen, whether or not there's a master lease supporting it, eventually the house, that starts to crumble. And so our interest is always to have a tenant there. And we don't get our rent until you get your tax dollars. And so we believe we are aligned with you in the sense that if Penn's doing a terrible job at running this facility, that's bad for us as well. So we're going to want a new tenant in there as well that will reinvest in the property and, you know, put, put money back in, refresh machines, do things that presumably in this case Penn is not doing. So we believe we're aligned with the state, with the Commonwealth in, in that regard. And in, and in that, I mean, we, we are, um, f from a financial standpoint, we're financially sound because of our structure, not because we do it better. We're more financially sound than most of the gaming operators out there because most of our cash flows go to our shareholders. So our business is very simple. Um, we take in rent. We pay out 90% of that net income and dividends to our shareholders. We keep ourselves levered at a point where we believe is prudent, which we've said is about five and a half times levered. And as of today, Fitch, Fitch Ratings came out with a rating on our debt today, hadn't previously rated us. We'd only been rated by Moody's and S&P. Fitch has rated us investment grade. So we have two of the three agencies have investment grade ratings on our debt. And so we believe we bring a stability to gaming, that we bring a partner, that we're, we're after the same things you are. Make sure there's a tenant in there that's doing a good job and paying the rent and keeping the machines running. Does do you or Enrique do you have any, any different sense of that? Well, and I well, don't think or, you're required if for some reason, Pat, and again hypothetically, um, somehow really tanked and lost license. It's a category two license. There's no obligation you put someone in that facility. Correct. You could put it, put it back out the bid. Right. Now again, I think to GLPI's point they'd be incentivized to make sure there's someone in that facility. Right. So it would be awful hard. It strikes me as a, the, the economic right. model might be hard for someone to go build something as opposed to occupy something that's already there. Right. Yeah. That's well said. Anybody um, else? You, you. 
Yeah, no, that's, that's it. I mean, I, I, there's a number of scenarios that you can think of, but it ultimately goes down to, you know, a question we asked of, 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 of the parties earlier and, and said, when it comes to licensing, that's really, or relicensing, that's really a, a risk they're willing to take. They understand that that's their highest and best use, and they'll make a case to continue running it for as long as, 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 um, as they can. Um, I have a question of, of Penn. Um, there's, in, in, in the... The terms, um, some Thank of the you. disclosure. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, some of the um, prior disclosures and, and some of the remarks that uh, Ms. Chang made. Uh, there's a notion that there will be about a hundred million dollars in annual savings as part of this transaction going forward. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and what happens if those? How is that going? And what happens if those? Uh, don't really come to fruition. Sure. Uh, Justin Sebastiano, VP of Finance and Treasurer at Penn National. So you mentioned the $100 million of cost savings. These are the synergies we announced at the, um, when we announced the deal back in December of 17. And so it's actually been going extremely well uh, during the, the, our due diligence. We came up with that number after we made the announcement and were able to really dig in more with help from the Pinnacle uh, corporate teams and property teams. We have more faith in that number now. And it's basically 50-50 between corporate, uh, the corporate structure savings and in what's out in the properties. And we think that probably happens over a 24-month period post-close uh, and probably split, split roughly 50-50. Maybe a little bit we'll get in Q4 of this year. We've announced on our last uh, conference call that we expect to close the transaction very early fourth quarter. So. Day one, obviously, there's the corporate redundancies, um, the C-suite, the um, duplicative costs of being a public company. We don't, you know, you don't need those costs now that there's only going to be one public company. So those sorts of costs will come day one, um, but the real bulk of it will probably happen over, you know, the 24-month period uh, after that. And so we think the corporate redundancies happen much sooner, uh, and some of the property. Uh, savings that we will have will be through uh, predominantly through the cost of goods sold and procurement and just getting those that purchasing power and that economies of scale that you would get becoming a much larger company so uh, while we haven't quantified publicly uh, how we're going to to do that we haven't laid out per se the, the blueprint obviously for competitive reasons but while we were very comfortable with that number now we are extremely confident in that hundred million uh, I would also say that there's likely revenue synergies on top of that, uh, and and so we feel very very comfortable with the number, and, and we really can't wait to to start operating this company as one larger company. Revenue synergies? Can you help me understand that? Sure. What that might be. Sure, and that's I, when we were talking about the five million uh, player database, just getting more of those customers in from from oh. the Pinnacle properties. Pinnacle does not have a Las Vegas Strip asset. We can now cater to those Pinnacle um, database players uh, and, and have them come to the Las Vegas uh, Strip where we have a property in Tropicana, Las Vegas, mm -hmm. and the M Resort in the locals market. Right. Great. Thank you. Anybody else? Questions or comments? All right. I think we have a vote. Is that next? Yep. Sure. You know, let me, uh, let me make the motion. Um, noting that, um, as I noted before, that this is a fundamentally economic transaction, something that results in, in real benefits to the parties uh, simply because of the structure. Um, there will be better cost of capital that was mentioned before, um, you know, in, in, in terms of um, the capacity of GLPI to borrow. Um, so I will move that the Commission approve the proposed uh, transaction uh, of the interim authorization for the sale of Plain Ridge Park Casino uh, to GLPI, as described here uh, today. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Thank folks. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Albano looks like he wants to say something. If I may, um, could we, I just want to Never make sure. Never speak clear after that. you win, don't forget. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure I have. Um, uh, is racing, uh, is the racing approval subsumed within the interim authorization that the commission just voted on? That's my question. General Counsel Blue is nodding yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 
Thanks again. All right, we are asking uh, Ombudsman Ziemba to return. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, uh, we're joined by Plain Ridge Park for their uh, <coughs> quarterly report for the second quarter of this year. We're joined here by Reuben Warren, Vice President of Finance, Michelle Collins, Vice President of Marketing, Marketing Kim Dixon, Vice President of Human Resources, Jason Gittle, Information Technology Director, uh, Lance George, General Manager, and Lisa McKinney, Compliance Manager, who also are also here to answer any questions you may have. And with that, I turn it over to Ruben. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Ruben. Good morning. No more hypotheticals. <laughs> um, so second, our second quarter uh, presentation in the uh, state's uh, fourth quarter. Revenue grew uh, in our second quarter, so $44 million in net slot revenues. That's 3.3% uh, better than the prior year. Uh, that is with disruption in our slot floor. We built a high limit facility with the VIP component. And Michelle will get into the details of what that looks like. Our total state revenue, 17.6 million. Uh, course race uh, revenues of just under 4 million, and total taxes of 21.6 million in the quarter. For lottery, uh, continue to be a great story for us. Uh, just under a million dollars for the second quarter, 932,000 was the number. Uh, that's just under 11% growth. So great partnership. And I think our customers, you know, love the convenience of, you know, the terminals being on property. For life to date, uh, Lottery has made about $8 million on, on our property through the terminals. And that's with, you know, partnering with our host communities, not really affecting uh, the host communities. We've actually grown those as well. Uh, and that's with, you know, people coming into the area. So I think it's a great partnership for both uh, Lottery and our host communities as well. For the state, uh, for the qualified spend, $1.5 uh, million for the total uh, for the quarter, uh, with 89% or $1.3 million um, being in the state of Mass. That number is slightly ele elevated due to some of the construction projects that we had on properties. The normal average for Mass is about 75%. Uh, this quarter is slightly above because of those reasons. What, what was that the high limit area that you redid recently, That's, for example? So we did the uh, on the horse racing side. We did okay. the barn roofs in the in that quarter, uh, and payments came in for that, and then partial payments for the high limit room as well. You'll okay. see most of those payments in the for the high limit room in the next quarter. Next quarter. Uh, for our host and and surrounding communities, uh, two hundred forty three thousand was the total spend. That's about fifteen point five percent of our. Uh, total qualified spend in the quarter. Uh, and then a Rentham vendor benefited from, you know, the construction on the property, i.e. the 64% here for, for that um, jurisdiction, for that community. Diversity uh, continues to be a good story overall. So we um, exceeded the goal in our uh, second quarter, 24% uh, um, compared to the 21% goal for the women uh, business enterprise. 14% compared to the 12% goal. Minority owned is right at the 6% goal and the veteran business uh, at 5%. And so through these, uh, through some of these uh, spectrums, um, our top three vendors for women business enterprises, uh, printing and signage, seafood, and Tito tickets for the slot machines. For the minority owned businesses, it would be technology, printing, uh, and marketing promotional gifts. And for the veteran business, it's marketing promotional gifts, uh, food and beverage uh, equipment repair, food and beverage disposable items. Uh, and through the partnership with Derek and Jill, the state, uh, and Veracloud, we have identified, you know, a few more vendors to shore up some of the areas that we were having issues with historically. Uh, and uh, through the corporate uh, procurement uh, partnership, uh, they brought in a veteran-owned business, i.e., the um, elevation in the percentage for the uh, 
second quarter. And so things are continuing to uh, improve uh, for the areas that we had some issues with the prior year. Compliance, uh, good story for the second quarter. Uh, just under 650,000 people through the doors. Um, and our security checked right under 20, right at 21,000 folks. That's about 3.3% of all visitors through the property. Uh, and the major components of that um, that we uh, turned away, uh, 291 total folks, were either invalid IDs um, or no ID, um, and just over 100, you know, folks that's either underage or minors that attempted to get on the floor that were turned turned away. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Kim so that she can go over our um, employment update. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. As of the end of the second quarter, our employment was up by 12 people, uh, 477. Full-time represents 305, which is 63.9% of the workforce. And part-time is 172, which, which represents 36.1% of the workforce. In terms of our breakdown of our employees, our numbers remain significantly the same. Diversity went up slightly to 26. Veterans have remained the same at 5%. Massachusetts uh, has gone down slightly, one point at, to 64%, and our local hiring is at 34%. Our male and female breakdown is 53% male and 47% female. We continue to focus on our in-state and local hiring. We are attending um, the Recruit Military Job Fair coming up in two weeks. During the second quarter, we attended the BBC Job Fair and we also held an on-site job fair. We are enhancing our social media recruitment as well with our talent acquisition team, focusing on member-only job boards, South Shore jobs, on Facebook, et cetera. Kim, just a, a, a quick point, and uh, I know Director Griffin is in here this morning because she's at uh, one of our Access and Opportunity Committee meetings. Um, I know you're in the process of kind of reshaping the workforce development plan for yes. Penn or PPC, um, you know, I was just on your website this morning, you still have anywhere between 35 and 40 openings. Do you consider those kind of ongoing openings? Are we still experiencing some turnover or some of those new positions or kind of what's the mix? Um, a little bit of all. So uh, we do have some recurring positions that continue to, we have continual turnover. Our turnover is actually lower than it's ever been. So year to date, we're at about 19.4% and annualized, um, we are much less than we were in 2017. We're down like 20 percentage points from 2017's annualized number. Um, we do um, continue to focus on, on the in-state hiring as well, working with the career fairs. We have all of our positions posted. Um, we're looking at setting up something on site soon. Okay. Um, just with talking with some folks from the governor's skills cabinet, more focused on, you know, they were looking for updates for progress with MGM, but they said, you know, we should circle back, go down and visit Plain Ridge, you know, bring in the career center folks and, and see how, again, we might be able to work with you, especially at this time where you're kind of redoing the workforce development plan. So Absolutely. happy to work with you on that. Next, to, um, to continue our update on our Women Leading at Penn initiative. So our next topic that we'll be discussing in the month of July is gender bias. We also wanted to give you an update on our Women's Expo. So we, again, we are thrilled to have Gail as our keynote speaker. Um, our advertisements have been posted. We will be able to hold about 225 uh, attendees and about 26 uh, vendors. So we've had significant interest with the chamber, uh, selling tickets as we speak. And um, I just wanted to mention too, some of the additional speakers that are going to be there. Jennifer Weissman is a new addition. She is our uh, chief marketing officer from Penn National. She is one of the founding women with the Women Leading at Penn Initiative. And Jennifer's gonna talk to the group about the initiative and you know the plans for Penn going forward. So we're excited to have Jennifer on the panel as well. Um, the rest of the speakers, Jen is going to, Jen Ozaginski, I said that wrong. Um, she's going to talk about authenticity and social media being authentic. Uh, Jen 
and uh, the rest of the, the group are all local. So they're all from Massachusetts, so we're excited that they all came here. Um, Ashley Perry, she owns Own Your Worth, and she's going to discuss negotiation skills. Shelly Berman Rubera, she's going to discuss about women succeeding in business, so small business owners. And then Dr. Mary Medeiros is going to focus on women in healthcare. So those will make up the breakout sessions for the Women's Expo. Great. All right, so for local community, we continue to support the local charities on a quarterly basis, and some of these you'll see um, quarter over quarter, but some highlights include we sponsored restaurant night for Lenore's Pantry at Slacks uh, at the property. We also participated in the Penn Initiative for Relay for Life. So every year what they do is they have all of the properties participate to see how much money we can each raise. It's a competition, really. And this year we came in seventh out of 20 properties where we raised over $25,000 for Relay for Life. Um, on a whole, Penn actually raised $427,000 this year. Where does that money go? Relay for Life. Is that an org there's an organization called Relay for Life? Yeah, so the, we work specifically for the North Atterboro uh, chapter, but yeah, it's, oh. it's cancer. It, it, oh, okay. It, yeah, all, all kinds of cancer. It's not specific to one. Right. Um, in addition to that, we have uh, been working with a local artist. His name is Theodore Arthur Charon. He is uh, raised in North Atterboro at his grandparents' farm and he went to the Art Institute of Boston. He graduated in 1972, and he is well known for many of his paintings. He's been um, recognized for over 100 nationally. So what we've done with him is we've taken some of his artwork, and if you've walked down from Slacks to the racing area, we've dis uh, displayed his artwork along those walls, which is a nice area to put it. And we're, we're allowing our customers who, if they opt to choose to spend their comp cash on a piece of art, they can do so. Sure. So this is just very new. We, um, I think, put them up about three weeks ago. So it's exciting. And uh, he's also going to be riding in the starter car, taking photographs of live racing. And then he's going to print, uh, draw the pictures. And we're going to do a uh, promotion for our guests where they'll receive the print of the picture. Oh. Uh, in addition to that, we continued our sponsorship with Nesson and Red Sox uh, with Winning Wednesdays. So as the Red Sox continue to have their lucky streak, um, we're at 12 wins for Wednesdays, which puts us at nearly $10,000 already towards our 2019 goal for Relay for Life. So that's very exciting. We also continued our Fenway Concert Series sp sponsorship. This allows us to do activation, to reach out to people and increase our awareness, but it also allows us to host our VIP guests in our suite so we can do kind of a, um, an experience with our hosts and the players so that they can enjoy something that we don't offer at the property. And then we partnered with Beasley Media Group doing an Xfinity uh, concert series where what they do is they have concert winners they bring a bus of 25 people to Flutie's beforehand, so they, they get to experience the restaurant, and then there's transportation to and from the concert venue. For marketing highlights, we just had our three-year anniversary. Uh, as Ruben mentioned, we also uh, finished the new High Limit area, as well as the VIP lounge. Uh, in this area, it's a more private area for our customers to play um, the high limit games, which is something that they were asking for. And we increased the count from 38 to 45 in that area. So, so far, it's been a great success, and, and they're really enjoying the privacy of it. Michelle, remind me, what is the high limit threshold? What do you, con what do you call high limit? It's any of the, the higher games. So we have $100, $25, $10, dollar, yep. And then um, in addition to that, we are bringing back Murphy's Boxing for their final um, boxing match in September. So we had done a four-year, uh, a four-time deal with them. So September will be the last one that we do for this year. We're also adding what- Is that likely to be something you renew? Does that work? 
Is that working? It does. It's a, it's a totally different demographic than what we would normally get. Right. So it's nice to be able to use the racing side for that and still have the excitement on the gaming side. Mm -hmm. So essentially, it's not much crossover, but it's still something that is exciting to offer. Um, we've started to work on the outdoor apron a bit. And I don't know if you've been there recently, but what we've done is we've taken the shack that was out there and we added a bar to it. So now when we do outdoor events, it allows us to offer hot dogs and cocktails. And um, we actually just had our, our banquet, banquet manager rent that space out for a company to do their company party outdoors, which was really nice. Great. And again, something different. So we're just working with our existing footprint to create new items that we can offer to um, the community and to our guests. In addition to that, we're adding a what we're calling a grab and game, which is essentially just kind of a snack bar for customers to grab a quick salad, to grab a quick sandwich, and um, that way they don't have to wait in a restaurant, and it's just something quick and easy for them to, to grab that we'll be putting in the food court. T tell me where that outdoor bar was again. Is that? So uh, right. on the apron off to, if you're facing the racing area, yes. it's off to the right. It was that white brick building. Oh, I see. Yeah, so okay. we kind of refinished it, added a granite bar and some stools. Oh, great. I'll have to take yeah. a look. Yeah, no, it looks great. Um, and also, we will be um, launching our win-loss, our monthly win-loss statements. So uh, Jason Gittle will be walking through you, that process with you, but what it is going to do is allow our customers to go on to Marquee Rewards online and actually get their um, statement each month versus yearly, which is the current standard with Penn. So they'll be able to see their win-loss statements, print them out, and access them whenever they want to. So he'll walk you through that right now. Good morning. Good morning. Oh. Morning. I would say just at a high, a high altitude description of the project, uh, roughly five or six months ago, we were approached by members of your staff uh, that we, we needed to develop a, and offer our patrons a, a monthly win-loss statement. Typically, we've, we've issued, uh, and Penn National has issued at all of its properties, an annual statement. Sometime around February 1st is when that occurred. So from a high altitude, uh, w this, this project came at a time technology-wise for Penn, where I'm not certain if you're aware we're changing our data warehouse for our, 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 our corporation. And that's the term Puma, if you've heard of it, has, has made its way to Puma 2. So one of the challenges in developing something of this nature that pulls information from our old data warehouse, otherwise known as Puma, is to make sure that it's forward compatible with what Penn will, and Plain Ridge Park will be using sometime in the January, February time frame we're scheduled. Uh, the Puma 2 engine has been rolled out at uh, two or three properties thus far successfully. We don't anticipate any failures on, on their approach to the Plain Ridge property. So what you're seeing here is it won't be impacted by that change that, that's coming. Um, as you know, uh, just a couple of quick thank yous. One is to Todd here, Todd Grossman, who has kind of served as a, a, a guiding point as, as to the law and what we need to provide uh, folks. And has uh, we've had several conversations over the last four or five months on tweaks and things along those lines to what you're about to see. Also, uh, Elena Jacks of the MGM IT deployment team uh, had several conversations. It would be a good thing to mention her as well to make sure what we're providing from a Penn perspective is similar to what they'll be providing shortly from an MGM perspective. And we think you'll see similarities. Uh, finally, Lisa uh, McKinney and Michelle Collins from a compliance and marketing perspective locally uh, helped steer us in the right direction as well, which arrives you to this point. And in your package, uh, plan B was to provide you some still shots, but uh, Late in the game, we decided maybe plan A would be better, and that's to show you uh, a live demonstration of the product. Without further ado, uh, the web player profile is located within a larger web engine or a larger website referred to as Marquee Rewards. www.marqueerewards.com allows the public to go in and take a look at all things Penn National all things promotional Penn National. And it has a secure element to it that it links this website, this public website, securely to all of our patrons. And we refer to that secure piece 
as the web player profile. So you're a, you, if you're a patron at any one of our properties, it is a place to log into and see things like promotional offers, uh, a, a tracking of their loyalty points and tier points, and what that means in, in their evolution as a customer of Penn. The login, thanks Mike for setting this up, uh, we've, we've created around the email addresses that are given to our baseline gaming system, as well as most of the major social engine credential credentials. So it's important to note that we don't need to have your email address to, for, for you to log in and, and see the web player profile. You can use your Facebook, Twitter, Yahoo, Google credentials, all, all the typical so, social engines. Brief moment to log in. We're picking on one of our hosts. So as I had mentioned, we are logging in securely with a username, which is typically the email address and a password that you're really able to select within the website in your creation. Th this brings you into a, a secure area where you're able to, I won't save this for you guys, where you're able to view things like, as I told you before, your offers, your tier info, and you're also able to find uh, information on local and uh, uh, and entertainment, local entertainment and entertainment across the Penn Enterprise. And I believe, folks, there is an account. This is a different layout. This is the uh, web. This is a, a layout for uh, designed also to work with phones and tablets and things of those nature. So there is a My Account section that allows you to log in and see different things across the enterprise. And here, here's where what we've done typically is an annual PDF that you can see as, as I hold my cursor over. This is the typical functionality where if you were to select a year, you're able to see and download a PDF that shows their win-loss uh, on an annual basis. One number, folks, one number. The screen has been added uh, with a dynamic check so that the customers are able to see their play in each month that there is an active rating at, at the Plain Ridge facility. So uh, you don't see months where there are no active ratings. And that's a discussion that uh, Todd and I have been going back and forth on and, and, and still under discussion of whether we want to present. Presenting no rating versus presenting a zero rating are two entirely different things here. So right now we're we're just we're excluding anything. We're not including months that do not have trips. So is there, is, I'm sorry, Anand. Yeah. Is there a reason there why uh, 2016 doesn't work? Is this just uh, dummy data? Or? Yes, sir. This is a test account. Okay. And we didn't mess around with it in 2016. Okay. So. Uh, as we as we dynamically take a look at the, the play on this account, we, we were testing obviously in 2015. You can see the equation of coin in minus coin out plus jackpots equals the total. That gives you a total num a total number for the month of win loss. Green being win, red being loss. And and again, you can hop around it dynamically. Uh, this is the same math you'll see from the other licensee opening in 10 days. Same, same, same thing. And then finally... Uh, Could you just open up 403 again? Open up that oh, certainly. May number? Yep. So that means that the, the better bet, $163 and won, 556. Am I getting that right? Yes, sir. Okay. So, so one of the things we took from... Mr. Grossman, is that we're, we're potentially going to, one of the ads or the revisions that you'll see in the coming <coughs> month is we're going to add definition to what these terms mean <coughs> okay. that are more layman in nature. Right, because coin in, coin out is, coin in, coin out is obscure to a lot of folks. Yes, 
it's so, uh, so we, we talked about the coin in number. It does not mean that the person took $163 out of their wallet and put it into the machine. Right. That's the total amount right. they bet going up and down. Well, this right. this is a topic I've had with some folks, and that that is completely obscure to people, I think. I mean, people think that you go in with $100, and then if you lose it, you've lost $100. But your system says if you started out winning 100 and then you lose everything, you've lost 200 right? So the consumer thinks they lost 100 and the machine thinks they've lost 200 So explaining that to people, I mean, maybe I'm, maybe I'm, I'm but I've, I've talked to a lot of people about it and people, people intuitively think it means how much cash out of my pocket did I lose? And in fact, it means something different because it counts the money you theoretically had when you had wins. Mm -hmm. Not theoretically, I mean, you did have it if you'd chosen to cash out at that point, but you don't. But that's, that's really confusing to people. Yes, sir, we got the same feedback from Mr. Grossman. We're going to be adding, as we said, right here in this white section next to coin in, coin out, Jack, we're going to, we're going to give a better description of what it means. I'm interested to know whether any of you has any, is there any feedback from customers about whether they, your, your, like your marquee rewards players, whether they understand this distinction? Is there any way that, it probably doesn't come up very often, but. Uh, it does come up, but. Um if they're an uh, experienced gambler, they typically do understand what it is, right. but somebody just walking in and signing up for a card, it, it is very confusing. Right. What we try to just explain to them is it, it's literally every time they hit that button, that's what the coin in is. It has nothing to do with what they physically put in the machine. Right. But again, when they want offers and they're trying to figure out what they should be getting versus what they are getting, it's, it, it is confusing. Yeah. Which is why we've talked about adding words like estimated in here, because the total is not necessarily the pure total money that you've actually won or lost. It, it, there's a number of different factors. So using words like estimated kind of gets you closer to what that number actually reflects. Um, Except it's not important. estimated. It, for, given the definition, it isn't estimated. It is real. And that's the number that we report you know, to, uh, to the state, and that's what we tax against and so forth. So or that we include, we include when we report uh, when, you know, what was, the, what was the win or what was the drop, what was the payout. You know, it's based on that, that algorithm. So it's not really estimated. That might not be the best word. Well, the tax is different. Tax is based on the GGR, drop. right. I mean, but when we, re I'm sorry, I misspoke. When we report GGR and tax, we also report coin in. That, on that we do scene. report that right. out. That, that's right. Um, so yeah, the word estimated might not be ideal, but as Mr. Gittle mentioned, uh, they'll work on some explanation okay. for here so people understand what these numbers mean. You know, it's important to, 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 to lay out that the law speaks in different terms, not coin in and coin out. It, it speaks in terms of uh, total bets, right? total amounts. One, so I think it would be a useful exercise to tie these terms <coughs> into what the law states. And, and, and it might be more understandable for our guests. Hmm. Perhaps I've been looking at these two, two for a while, but I think it's pretty straightforward when you make the addition, you know, to come up with a total. Yeah. Uh, but, but I'm glad can you're I, working on the... Can I add one thing? So estimated could be um, our customers don't always understand you have to have the card in. And sometimes they think the card's in and they're betting. And so I think the estimated is really uh, saying that if you insert the card appropriately, it's going to track your play. And if you don't, there's going to be this, you know, estimation of really what you, lo what you lost. So it's count. really on the customers. I'm sorry. It doesn't count what you sneak over to the other machine and don't use your card and just play <laughs> with cash, right? Well, and by the way, this term is going to be, that point is going to be a lot more important with the tables because that, talk about rate play, uh, that really becomes you know, as, as good as an estimate anybody can do, but it's still an estimate. Yes, sir, and without giving you testimony for another licensee, you'll find that their, their presentation of the data is very similar to what we're proposing here. But with one additional breakout, they, they break out slots versus table one. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the, just to, to close the presentation, if we were to run uh, a PDF of annual win-loss, this is what the patron would see. And as I had said earlier, we're, we're just, this is what we have been doing to date. Uh, this is a presentation of one number versus, versus, bye, everybody. 
everybody. Whoops. How did you get me back to the I don't know. Is it different? Going back to the yeah. website. Going back to it, I think. And versus what we're proposing in the same time period on a monthly basis, the statement is also available, but you'll see some some similarities to the dynamic screen we presented here mm -hmm. with uh, a monthly breakout of their win loss. That annual statement was set up as a letter. Did you mail that out or do you mail that out? We've we've not typically mailed them out only if they've requested it. We we typically make them available via this web player profile. Right. And we discussed that and said that was okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I just thought it was interesting that you're it sets up like a letter. Yes, sir. Well, it's good for tax purposes by the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would think patrons would appreciate this change because every other financial transaction we make, it's we're notified monthly of what that is. So we're well, very accustomed to right. being notified monthly of whatever that is. And that lingo that you just mentioned was a base part of how we, we formed this and took a look at things like credit card statements and how we're presenting mm -hmm. data, how they present data. So we've arrived at this. Technically, we're ready to launch. There are some uh, compliance hurdles and some things that we're signing off internally. Uh, we've picked the date of September 1st, uh, and we, we can be ready technically to do that. Great. Very Great. Good. Thank you, Mr. George, too, for your oversight here. Is that it? All right, we will switch over to uh, Wynn. Yep. Thank you, everybody. Really good you numbers. Yeah. You can see the effort is there. So um, appreciate it. And look forward to Thank the you. event in, in September. Okay. Well, we are still with Ombudsman Ziemba. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So next up, we have the quarterly report for the second quarter for Encore Boston Harbor. We're joined by Robert DeSavio, President of Encore Boston Harbor, Jackie Crum, Senior Vice President and General Counsel, and Peter Campo, Director of Construction. Let me turn it over to Bob. Thank you, John, and good afternoon, Commissioners. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm very pleased to report there's been significant progress on the site since our last quarterly update. And um, while I know the entire team is dedicated to uh, getting the MGM up and running. I would suggest after the opening and when you can catch your breath, um, please call f to arrange some tours uh, because I think you'd be very impressed at progress um, since our last quarterly update and it's going, it's going really quickly on site. Um, I want to just, before I turn it over to Peter, say I just, thank you. I just okay. highlighted Janice to, uh, to do some, suggest get some tours to maybe in the fall up, would yeah. be great. That'd be great. Um, and before I turn it over to Peter to jump right into the construction update, Peter, thank you for you and the team and John Fish at Suffolk for um, really moving this thing forward. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Peter Campo. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, yes. Uh, I'd like to point out that we're going to put up the first uh, letter of the sign in the north side of the building tonight, and it's static. <laughs> <laughs> what letter is it? Thank you. No moving. <laughs> uh, we're on schedule. We have 314 days to go. I'd like to point out before I go too much farther that the team is just um, working with a great bunch of people. The construction manager, Suffolk, is doing a great job. The, we, we've got about 150 people in the office there. The design team, everybody's pulling together and really making it happen. The, uh, all of the trade partners have been doing a fantastic job, and the entire workforce has just been outstanding. And they're all excited about the job, and the quality has been excellent. We're averaging about 1,600 workers a day on site. Uh, most of those are in the first shift with selected trades on the second shift. We're 69% complete from a time standpoint, 66% complete from a labor standpoint, and just over 70% complete from a cash standpoint. So we're tracking, we're tracking really well, and we're excited about that. I wanted to point out that um, in this presentation that Jackie insisted I use June 30th uh, photos. I want permission next time to use current ones because we made a tremendous amount of progress in the last six weeks. But if we go to the next slide, I'll show you the. the so in the the site work, we've planted about 60 or 70 percent of all the major trees, and all the walkways are, are being installed. And you'll see on the South Peninsula, we're on schedule to complete the South 
Peninsula by the 1st of September. There'll be some minor plantings, but that, that includes the natural, the uh, artificial turf on the South Peninsula. And then we're at the front entry on Broadway, we're also, those plantings, large trees are, uh, are planted. And we probably have about 75% of the pavement installed and we'll continue to work, work that around the entire site. Uh, there's a view of the South Peninsula. It's much more developed today. Keep going. Wow. So the walkway, which is just fantastic. Um, the garage uh, structure, we're punching out the uh, B4 and B3 levels. Those will be ready to be uh, turned over in October. We won't be using them, but we're going to just complete them and get the punch list done. The B2 level is right behind that, and the B1 level is also in great shape. We're using those for temporary storage. We'll turn those over later, but they're all essentially complete. Um, this is an image of the uh, front of the casino. That is all enclosed now. All the stone and the epis is in, in, installed. There's a little bit of green sheathing left on the, where the bus entry is, but that's all almost complete. You can see uh, on the podium, uh, the. Yeah, you see, there's an image of the tower. That curtain wall is complete now to the roof. Uh, we'll you, mentioned, the tower you mentioned in a you were putting up the first letter. You said on the north side. The north side. So are you going to have signs, signs on both north oh, and south? North and oh, south. All right, so the big one will be south. But south. going to be, okay. Yep. Um, the encore name is slightly smaller on the north side because the, the, as the building swo swoops, the, the E had to be smaller to fit right. that in. Right. But, yeah. Oh. Okay. It starts tonight. Oh, the capital E didn't fit as much as the other. Well, it's on the lower end. It on the lower side. Because it's on the lower end. It's on the lower end. So that'll be done this week, and the south side will be done uh, the first week of September. Uh, the, the tower cranes, just for the record, are scheduled to come down in the next 30 days. The first one comes down uh, starting about the 20th. And that's a big milestone for us to get those tower cranes down. That allows us to finish where they penetrate the roof and the podium level. So that's a big, big milestone. And the uh, temporary hoist is scheduled to come down mid-September, and that allows us to enclose the remaining pieces of the tower and, uh, and uh, you know, finish those rooms up that we left out. The podium gaming, um, go to the next image. So. The light fixtures are actually hung in this space right now, and we're installing the raised flooring. We've got about 20 to 25 percent of the raised flooring installed in the gaming area. And the gaming area is about a month ahead of schedule right now, which is great because that'll allow us to move the game machines in. As everybody knows, it's crucial to have the time to install those uh, timely. So that's continuing to, to develop, and we're right on schedule. Uh, this is the center bar area. Um, again, those, are, um, those stairways are, are open now, and we're installing the railings on those stairways as you, as you go up to the upper limit gaming. Uh, the convention area is about a month ahead of schedule. Uh, the facade is more developed than you can see, see now. I think the next, do you have in the next? No, oh, that's from the end. There's another view of the tower uh, and the development of that facade. Um, but that's mostly enclosed now. We're installing the glazing and those openings as you come around in the convention se center. The building's completely weather tight at this point. Um, hotel tower, we're installing drywall on the 27th floor. Floors five, six, seven, and eight are almost complete. Uh, we're carpeting floors five and six right now as we speak. Uh, tile is up to, up to about the 16th floor. That's always one of our finishes because a ton of stone. One of our challenges is making sure that we have the, enough people for the finishes. That's proceeding just, just as planned, if not better. So we're pretty excited about that. And so the whole assembly line of the tower is on schedule to turn those, start turning those rooms over in December. And then you can see a view here of the curtain wall and, and up the Mystic River. But that curtain wall is complete up to the top of that structural steel on the south side. There's only about maybe 80 panels left to go. So the curtain wall will be complete 100% within two weeks. It's a great picture, great view. I was up there yesterday in the very top of the swoop, 380 feet. The views are spectacular. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It's really amazing. And there's, that's just a view of the skyline. There's nothing behind the swoop, right? In the, on the roof? No, just it's, structural steel, just structural steel. El uh, elevated machine room, uh, that, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. 
We're on schedule. <laughs> <laughs> no, if there's any particular questions, I think I covered most of it. Yeah. I just had a question. You mentioned artificial turf. So in between all those plantings, you're going to use turf? Uh, yes. Well, in the center area, there's an artificial lawn, and there's two smaller areas either side that is an artificial lawn. Everything else between those plantings is 100% planted with shrubs or uh, flowers. We're starting to plant the roses out there right now. It's really beautiful. Mm. So everything will be planted out other than some turf areas in the middle. That's right. Yeah. The new so turf no natural pretty grass. Pretty It'll, you don't use any natural grass, just turf. Well, for, uh, just a comment on that event lawn. That space is about, it's about 20,000 square feet, and it's going to get a tremendous amount of use. And if you went with regular grass, you know, it'd look great the first day. Then you start putting a tent up and run events on it, and you put some rain on it, and next thing you know, it's just mud. And so for that area, similar to what we do in Las Vegas, there's certain areas where an artificial product, and especially in a high-use area like that, just makes all the sense in the world. But everything else is, um, you know, all natural landscape. And the newer turfs are pretty realistic oh, looking. They're great looking. Mm -hmm. And it'll give us, again, the flexibility to use that. It has drainage components that are built into it. So, you know, you're not worried about puddling or flooding or any yeah. of that. So it, it's really probably the right use for us. And it looks much better during the winter, too. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's yeah. been the, uh, the, um, your experience with the labor force? Have you, have you been, had any trouble? You said you were we concerned have had about maybe getting the, uh, the people for the Tiles. Tiles. I think if you remember before, one of my challenges I've always been worried about is getting enough high quality trades persons for the finishes. To date, we've had no problem at all. Hmm. It's been really, the response has been great. Great. Really, really terrific. One other point I wanted to make is the marquee sign on Broadway is scheduled to be erected in September. Uh, so that's pretty mm -hmm. exciting. Mm -hmm. also, a, also static. Also static. <laughs> <laughs> No video screen video. on that one. <laughs> there's, a, there's a note in the bigger report on page 7. You, you, uh, it said back in April you filed a license application for phase 1 of the DCR Harbor Walk connector project. Can you just kind of refresh our memory as to what piece of the connector that is? So um, we have that permit for phase 1, and that's the first piece that connects us over to the DCR property. Okay. We also have uh, permission almost there for phase two also. So we expect to do phase one and phase two this fall. So we'll put that walkway in from our property all the way over to DCF. Great. Thank you. Jackie? Sure. And it's one sorry, Jim, oh. and what about uh, either or both of you, where are we on the possibility of the bridge, the right. bridge? Oh, so I was actually oh, just going to address sorry. that. Okay. No That's all right. Uh, before we get into off-site infrastructure, I know that uh, there were questions about the pedestrian bridge. So our corporate team has authorized us to go ahead with the design and permitting uh, for the bridge. So we will be paying for that. Obviously, it will have to be done in close coordination with uh, both DCR and uh, DOT and MBTA. So there's a number of components to this. One is the actual bridge, of course, but it connects over to the uh, DCR park. And we, we're working with DCR to see how that can be redeveloped. And uh, if we can get a connection into the head house, which will connect us to the Assembly Row T station. Uh, you know, the last thing we want is a bridge that drops off in the middle of nowhere. Right. And people don't have access. And uh, it's very difficult to cross the tracks at that point. So it would add a substantial amount of walking if it just dropped off into the DCR park. So we're working very closely with um, all the different agencies, including uh, the, uh, John. And uh, we hope to have more of a report as we move forward. Great. Yeah. Good. On the uh, off-site infrastructure, as you know, we've broken it into four different uh, packages. Uh, the first one, which we call uh, CP1, which is Broadway and the truck route, uh, has, has been our biggest challenge to date. Uh, what we've been trying to do is coordinate with Eversource, who received permission to put in a transmission line along the same route. And for obvious reasons, uh, both the city and Eversource and we all wanted to coordinate that effort so we weren't rebuilding all the streets and then having Eversource come in sometime you know, within a month or a year later and ripping out the streets and putting in the transmission line. Um, 
We've been in close coordination with Eversource, but for various reasons, they're significantly delayed on their project. And uh, so we're trying to work out how we can uh, add extra shifts, how they can add extra shifts, and, and try to get back on schedule, whether we just need to go ahead. Uh, we do have a plan currently, but it's a very tight plan. It does have us open, it does have all the work complete before opening, but it would mean that we have to go back in the uh, spring rather than finishing up in the fall. On uh, CP2, this is Route 16, and as you can see, we're uh, scheduled to complete this fall. On CP3, this is Malden and Wellington and the MBTA station, also on schedule to complete this fall. And uh, CP4 is Sullivan Square and the uh, MBTA station, the work that we're doing um, in the actual station uh, has been more time consuming than we uh, anticipated, but we are still on schedule to complete this fall. Jackie, uh, I noticed on this graph you have some things that start green, which is work completed, and then they extend to pink, which is delayed. That shows the delay in, so that isn't work completed, sorry, that is the work that should have been completed by that time, but it's been delayed through the yellow. Okay. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. But they don't appear to be in the critical path. No, I mean, if we needed to go back in the spring for any of this, we could, but our goal is to try to get it done in the fall. Mm -hmm. Bob? Great. Um, I wanted to provide an update on our um, uh, diversity in the project. Uh, the design phase, not too much new there. Um, our goal on the MBEs was 7.9%, and we uh, are finishing up at about 8.9%, exceeding that goal. The WBE goal, which was 10%, we're currently at about 7.8, and we've been over the last few quarters trying to add whatever we could on that particular goal. On the veteran goal, it was 1%, and we far exceeded that at 6.6. .6. So overall, uh, the goal was 18.9, and we came in at a, at a very strong 23.3% over our uh, initial goal. And the design work is pretty much wrapping up at this point. Um, the contracting side has been an incredible uh, story uh, on the MBE front. Uh, we're at we're five percent goal. We're at about six percent currently, and that represents about seventy-five million dollars worth of work. Uh, the WBE goal was five point four, and we're at ten point eight percent, and over one hundred and thirty-six million dollars. And the VBE goal was one percent. We're at about two point six percent, currently hovering a little over thirty-two million. So in total, uh, we had a goal of 11.4%. We're currently running 17.4%, and that re represents uh, $218 million worth of work on a, a total of about 230 contracts. So we're very pleased with the effort um, that the team has put forth on trying to be as inclusive as possible. On the construction uh, workforce, um, we're doing very well there as well. Uh, on the minority front, we had a goal of 15.3%. We're, we're currently hovering just below 25% at 24.9. Our female numbers have been very impressive. Um, a goal of 6.9, and we're right at 6.8, so we're hovering right around the goal. And I'm sure you probably saw this week, this was the subject of a really great feature that Contessa Brewer did with CNBC. Um, they came and visited our property. They s spoke with the commission. They uh, spoke with MGM, and that story got spun out all over the place. Lots of nationwide coverage on that uh, because uh, our, both our project and MGM's are far exceeding uh, what is the typical norm of a 2 to 3 percent uh, for females in the construction workforce, and we've been far exceeding that number, and it was really a great story and got lots of national attention. Uh, on the veteran goal, we had a goal of 3 percent. We're currently over double that at 6.4%. So again, another great story uh, this quarter as well on the construction workforce. Um, the outreach is three pages, and I was looking at this, and in some months, it's almost an event a day. Wow. And so we have people all over the place covering um, just an amazing variety of local and community and diverse organizations to try to get our word out. Um, it's been extremely successful. 
Um, the jobs events have been very encouraging, including one we just had recently in Everett um, that we had a morning and an evening session that was terrific. So I will not, I'm not going to read you all these names, but you can see that it's really um, a very, very wide cross section of community groups and our, our team's done a wonderful job in terms of doing that outreach. Mm -hmm. And we've so with got, that, I want to, I want to open it up for questions from any of the commissioners. Um, Bob, this is an impressive list. Is it a combination of kind of site updates versus vending opportunities versus employment opportunities? I mean, is it it's a little an equal bit, mix or is it predominantly on the workforce side? Or? It's going to move more towards workforce as we obviously we're going to get into that very large hiring wave after the first of the year. And you can't do that in a short window. So there's a lot of prep work to that hiring wave. So if I, I looked out the other day at what uh, Jenny and the employment team were doing, and it, it's skewing now much more towards workforce. And then right behind that, we're in the process of preparing for the commission the vendor goals. So it's going to move from a heavy emphasis in employment to right behind that on procurement for goods and services for after we open. So we kind of tailor the events to what the current needs are. But right now, it's going to be a big spike in employment events. Okay. But there's also a significant part of community outreach. So, you know, last week or the week before, uh, we had a whole team from our office go out and pull uh, the water chestnuts from the Mystic River. Yeah, that was because a great they, event. Uh, yeah, it was a great event. <laughs> really? Wow. Um, we, Jill has gotten some very fit, positive feedback on your workforce development plan. Some one professional wrote in that he'd never seen a workforce development plan as impressive and as comprehensive as that in his life. And he was, you know, he was a, a professional in the business. Um, and also saw the door knockers that you are putting mm -hmm. out in Everett. Where, where are those going? They did them all throughout the community. And one of the main goals was to, to promote the event that we just had. Uh, and, uh, you know, the mayor was there and a lot of the city councilors and as I mentioned, we did two sessions, one at 8 in the morning, one at 6 in the evening. And we had lines out the door and down the street. We had to do crowd control at a hiring event. And people were walking around saying, I don't get this. I thought there was low unemployment. And yet we were just, just jammed at there. So it tells us that, um, yeah, there is low employment. But I think our story is really positive. And if people are looking for a career and to want to be with a company for a long time, hopefully will be a job of choice because we were very, very impressed with the results. People came in, they were well dressed, they had resumes. Um, we brought in all of our department heads so they could literally in one room just go around and, and make stops at about 15 different tables and check in with department heads. So, uh, you know, and the mayor, he really was, behind, we, when you think about his involvement with the project, his number one item was jobs for Everett residents. He loved the project, but for him it was a lot about the employment. And he couldn't have been more proud, I think, at that event when he saw that finally, after all this time, this is where the fruits of the labor really paid off. And the door knockers was a great idea to just go out there and literally let people know that there was this sort of event coming up and also to introduce our uh, web portal and uh, what's going on. There's a lot of uh, excitement about that. I've used those many times in political campaigns in days gone by, but I don't know that I've ever seen it in a... For employment. For employment or even a business. It works. Yeah, it got it people great. out. It so great. it was great news. Yeah, Just, yeah I, I, I saw it as well and thought it was a great idea. And obviously your numbers, uh, so all of your efforts are really paying off, and it's just really nice to see um, how much effort and uh, the results are there. So really good work. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. Well, uh, I, I, Share the same thoughts. Um, can I uh, just go back a little bit to the Eversource? Sure. Um, so um, you, you mentioned that the, the effort is tight. Um, of course, you cannot control all of it. You, there's some requirements that you have to do, but it's behind the Eversource work. Um, can you speak a little bit about what would be the situation if they continue to have their delay on their side? Yes, uh, so we've had numerous meetings with them and the city of Everett, and one of the things that we're considering is whether at some point we just go ahead with the work that we need to do. Uh, unfortunately, that means that they would have to come back at a certain point and, and rip a portion out. 
and go back and do that, but that's certainly under consideration. We're also talking to our contractor to see what we can do to really expedite that work in the springtime. So um, they seem confident that if Eversource does what they need to do over the course of the fall and a little bit into the winter, that they can do that in time. We just, we, we would have liked to have finished the work in the fall, so. Sure. Yeah. yeah, you remember our original schedule, we had said if we could, we'd love to do all that road work in this calendar year. Mm -hmm. And then we just wouldn't have to worry about it next year. But this one piece, unfortunately, uh, dragged out a little bit. But that's yeah. why we left ourselves a good a good buffer in there for just uh, you know when you start road work you never know what's going to happen uh, so I'm glad we left a little buffer and hopefully we can catch that up and and uh, we will make sure we're done by the spring and Eversource has gone back to the, to the city and asked for some relief in terms of the times of day that they can work and the number of uh, crews that they can have uh, so the city's been very accommodating in getting that done uh, obviously we're trying to balance that with significant traffic delays in uh, along the Broadway area. And uh, so I think the nighttime work is, has certainly gone a long way. And, and remind me, that work is related to the casino or not related? No, it's completely no. unrelated. Yeah. It's, it's a transmission line that goes through Chelsea, Everett, right. and other communities. And we were just trying to coordinate. Sure. Well, in VAPD, if we ever have to find ourselves in a situation where you have to do the work for compliance with 23K and and then somebody else is going to go rip that work out it's later on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as you can appreciate, too, what we don't want is to be open, and then they open the streets again, too. So yes. It's, yeah. and, and I must say, Eversource has been working with us in good faith to do this. They've run into delays that were, frankly, unanticipated. Uh, you know, they've uh, hit utilities that they, didn't, that they didn't anticipate, so that requires research, and uh, it, it is a coordinated effort to get it done. Mm -hmm. Great. Anybody else? Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Item number seven, racing division. Six. six. Oh, I'm sorry. Six. What was six? Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nothing personal. No offense taken. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, uh, I have uh, before you today uh, 11 positions um, to consider for exemption. Um, these positions are all at MGM Springfield. Uh, one is an MGM Springfield employee uh, for in the bowling alley, and the remaining are all at Western Mass News. Um, these are all uh, in line with previous uh, exemptions that have been granted. I reviewed these uh, with MGM and found them all to be um, suitable in terms of the criteria that the commission set forth uh, earlier this year um, and am recommending that they be exempted. Paul, quick question. Sure. Um, uh, you know, the bowling, bowling alley attendant position, do we know how many jobs that actually translates into, like how many people they actually plan to hire for that position? I do not have a, an exact number of the headcount for that. must be a handful. I believe yeah. it would be a handful. I think it's, if you think of a typical, you know, having seen the bowling alley, the number of lanes, how busy it'll be, a couple of shifts per day. Yeah. Um, so it'll be a good, you know, a good number of folks, um, but certainly not a, a tremendous number. Okay. Um, who's Western Mass News, a tenant of the? That's correct. Yes, they're, they're a tenant uh, in, uh, right off of the outdoor plaza. So in that block there, they have uh, Western Mass News will be a tenant. Um, they'll do, uh, you know, produce news in that, uh, in that uh, space, um, you know, with kind of the floor to ceiling window. So as I've heard it described, it's going to be pretty interesting. Walking by, you'll be able to see, you know, the business of news happening, so to speak. I think it's the old Channel 40 ABC affiliate in Springfield. I agree with the recommendation. I'm just uh, curious as to sure. why we didn't exempt them from from the get-go or deem them to be perhaps questionable of exemption. Well, but and, I agree and with the recommendation. Sure, and a lot of that, uh, Commissioner, it, it's a good point. It's because some of these, the, the positions weren't really identified in, until this point in time. Yeah. So we've been kind of taking them as they come, which is why, for example, the bowling alley attendant as an MGM employee, it's, it's a newer position that they've created. Um, frankly, I think out of whole cloth, because as far as I'm aware, I don't know if there's another bowling alley attendant at MGM. 
I could be wrong, but uh, I know they have to, you know, they have to generate these positions at a corporate level um, and cascade them down. So, so there will, um, which brings up the point, this won't be the last time I imagine I'm in front of you. Um, certainly not, you know, Encore, there's, there's the entirety of the work really there to be done. Um, Plain Ridge, there could be additional exemptions as well as MGM in terms of requests that I might bring before you. Other discussion? Mr. Chair, I'd move that the uh, commission approve the uh, gaming service employee exemptions as provided in the packet. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Great. Well, Thank forgotten you. but not brief. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> now you. item number seven. Dr. Lightbound. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Today, the first item on the agenda is the Suffolk Downs request for additional race days. They've asked for September 15th and 16th to be added. And um, along with that request comes the request for $1.1 million in um, racehorse development funds for their purse money, which is consistent with what they've been um, spending over the weekend so far. Um, today, I've got Bruce Barnett, Legal Counsel, and Jessica Paquette. Uh, communications director from Suffolk if you have any questions. Mm -hmm. I know there was a concern last year because of football or whatever else happens in September, you didn't do quite as well with the September dates as you did with the summer dates. The same concern this year or? I would have to go back and check the numbers from last year, but I think we're early enough in the football season uh, with just preseason it will, would be okay. Okay. Jill and Julia and Edmund won't be playing anyway, oh, so, so who's, who's going go to the races? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, 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 you know, it is a way for our local folks to, um, to race and, and others, and um, certainly I agree with the recommendation to, uh, to allow these dates. And it always seems to generate enthusiasm and a pretty big audience, and mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. hopefully tells our legislature that yes, there should be a future for thoroughbred racing. So that's a positive. Too. Yeah. Any other comments? Yeah, yeah, this is not a question for the from for the request, but how was the last uh, weekend? The one that was at the last minute or the last day in in jeopardy of not coming to fruition. They did well. We um, really didn't have uh, horses that scratched because of the legislative thing. I think the uh, it was resolved early enough that everybody still came that wanted to. Um, there was a lot of rain earlier in that day, so the races came off the turf except for the big race they were going to have. So um, there were horses that scratched for that reason, but that could happen any time. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. I invite, I don't know, commissioners, if you have had the pleasure of meeting Jessica Paquette, um, the communications director, but uh, Chip sends his um, regards and his uh, apologies for not being able to be here. Between the two of us, we're hoping to yeah. uh, maybe make up for the gap, but uh, okay. I, I'd ask her if she had anything to say about last weekend. On. There we go. That helps. I thought the weekend went very well. We did have, like Dr. Lightbound said, the races came off the turf. But I didn't think there were really that many scratches, considering the field size really held up for the uh, for both days of the weekend. And the crowds were good. We had a pretty solid crowd on both days, even with the rain. I think some of the uncertainty leading up to it at least made people excited to come out once they realized they could. I uh, had the uh, opportunity to attend Sunday's races and. Uh, Executive Director Bajorjian did as well, and we both got to attend the George Brown Memorial Race, which was a very nice tribute um, and a uh, very good race, too. So anyway, just wanted to add that, that it was really nice to be there and, and feel that energy again. Great. Mr. Chair, I also I support the request and, and Dr. Lightbaum's recommendation. I did have a question, though. Is there, um, just looking at the other item on your agenda about the uh, mass breeders requesting a race at Finger Lakes. Does that impact your ability to field mass bred races for the day you have in September? My, my understanding is the mass breeders are planning on trying to race the um, uh, Norman Hall stakes, and that one hasn't been able to be raced at Suffolk, um, and that would be nice if it could be done at Suffolk this year. It's for two-year-olds, so they're not uh, typically ready that early in the season, so it needs to okay. be run later. And so um, my understanding is that's going to be aimed for the uh, September dates, and the mass readers are um, aware of the Suffolk 
uh, request. And one of the reasons why they put in their request was to um, have races so the horses would be fit still, uh, despite the six week gap from the August date to the September date. Yeah, okay. On, on the dates uh, that I've seen for the breeders in the Finger Lakes, they, they don't have any September dates. They've got August, October, November, I think. Uh, so They were looking for two in September, but okay. I, uh, that, that's an error on my part on that um, memo on my recommendation letter on the mass breeders, which I'll correct when I get to that part. They're, just, they're looking for, um, uh, let's see, they're not looking for the September, they're looking for October, November. On their dates. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank so it you. doesn't interfere with Suffolk. If uh, if I might, since uh, you brought up the mass breeders, um, we've usually uh, uh, taken pains to explain, um, as you know, well, you know, we don't need to explain to you that the resource development fund money, a portion of it is set aside for the uh, breeders, and a portion of it is is general purses, and we usually explain how we. Uh, run on behalf of the MTBA uh, races, the stakes races, where they use the, the breeder's portion of the money. Um, this year, we've also done a few races um, uh, for mass breads that are not part of the breeder's program. They're, they're out of the, uh, the rest of the uh, general fund of the, of the purse money. We've done a few of those so far. We're planning on a couple more of them uh, for the September weekend if you approve it uh, to, again, increase the chance for the local horsemen to run and uh, earn some purse. Thank you. So, Mr. Chair, I move that the Commission approve the request of Suffolk Downs for two additional days of racing, September 15th and 16, 2018, um, and that the Commission approve the additional $1.1 $1 million for purses for these days. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Mm -hmm. Thank Good you very up. much. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for the uh, delay there. We have an extra person on our uh, agenda today, so I wanted to make sure I had everybody right. Um, we have a request before us for the Massachusetts Breeders Association to race races at Finger Lakes. This is something the commission has approved since the uh, legislature changed, I believe it was in 2015. Um, today we have Kathleen Reagan, board member, Arlene Brown, board member and secretary, and uh, Donna Pereira, board member, if there's any questions. Um, and as I stated in my um, memo regarding this, um, I stated the months wrong. They've got two in August, and then instead of September, it should be October and November. Um, and um, they have a letter that describes uh, the different races they're planning on racing. And um, as stated, uh, they're hoping to be able to race the uh, Norman Hall stakes in the September itself, if you have any questions. Anybody? Um, you know, I know we, we, um, we had uh, one comment that was not in favor of this, yeah. and uh, we've gone through this before, and I think until there's a full-time racetrack in Massachusetts where these folks can run, there is no perfect solution. But it is an opportunity for uh, the breeders to make their money back. Um, it's the only way they can take that money is when they run races and win races. So, uh, you know, I'm in favor of, uh, of uh, allowing the additional races. 
Yeah, I was going to speak to that uh, to that comment. Perhaps uh, ask a couple of questions. Um, the rationale I, I have, I've, I've gone along with, uh, but now now we become a little bit of a cumulative effect that that makes us at least me, makes me wonder. Um, there's always the year um, provisional year that the legislation gets approved on and continues the uncertainty. So, can I ask? Um, there has been a, a, um, a breeding program uh, through these uh, last years. What can you tell us relative to you know, the incremental benefit on the, of most recent years with the, with the monies coming to the program? Are you seeing any change in activity? Um, you mentioned two new falls in, in, your, in your letter here. It struck me as a little bit of anecdotal, but what else can you tell us relative to the actual breeding program? In, in, in your name. Ms. Ms. Brown, it sounds yeah, like. Right. I've been in communication with someone outside of the state who represents uh, mayor owners, and they were inquiring about our breeders program. Uh, they see that we can race in other states, and uh, they wanted information on our breeders program uh, because some of their mayor owners were interested in dropping their foals here this year. So I sent them all the information, and they're very interested in it. Which is a great uh, sign, but what about actual uh, breeding? What, what has taken place in the last couple of years? Uh, I believe we have 13 two-year-olds registered, uh, which is down. Uh, as far as yearlings, we won't know until uh, you know, yearlings get registered, which would be next year. Um, it's hard to tell until they're actually registered how many were dropped in the in the state. Mm -hmm. there, there was a noticeable drop um, after uh, there became a shortened thoroughbred meet. Um, there were, you know, usually around 35 or so bulls a year, and, and Arlene can uh, comment on that further. But um, once it happened, where they were, it was known that there was going to be a shortened meet. It dropped down to about 10 bulls a year. And then there was an uptick last year to 13, which mm -hmm. hope to improve on. And one thing we can do is this winter, uh, Department of Agriculture um, also shares responsibility for the breeders program, as well as the Gaming Commission. Some of the regs are in 128, which is the solely the agriculture regulations, and then some of it's also in the Gaming Commission regs. Um, and certainly one thing we can do over the winter is, is get together with the group and maybe um, brainstorm ideas that might help on the breeding end of it, so it's not just uh, a racing program where um, the, you're getting money for racing. Obviously, that's important, but it's also important. Some of the other states have looked at different ways of um, encouraging the breeding aspect of it more. And, and where I was leading to, thank you for that. Um, is there a component here of an opportunity cost? Meaning, are we allowing um, these requests to go to races, to go to purses, um, and and perhaps inadvertently keeping the money that would be available for actually breeding, um, you know, or is it purely a demand or a, a, a supply question in terms of breeders just not being interested in taking advantage of the breeding program uh, because of the uncertainty and the short meat? Yeah, I, I think the uncertainty plays a big part of it. Um, but certainly, the ideas like increasing breeders' rewards can make a difference. Um, they are there already are rewards like that in place for the um, owners of the stallion and the mayor and that type of thing. But certainly, you know, one thing to look at is would increasing that help? Um, some of the other states uh, pay people for the amount of time those horses are actually kept in the state, and that encourages. Um, that type of activity also. So there's different things that can be looked at. And, I've, and I think one of those, but my simple understanding of the breeding program is that this is the longest sort of long lead item. In order to have, let's, let's just say that, you know, next year the, the, the legislature finally addressed this, um, right. um, you know, um, short-term you know, renewal of the, of the racing um, statutes, we would still need two years or more for the breeding program to, you know, to come 
you know, to, to come to fruition. Um, so if we were to assume that next year they were, the legislature was going to address this more with more certainty towards thoroughbred racing, couldn't this be an opportunity for us, for, for everybody, to start thinking about the two-year lag that it takes to breed, uh, um, or until then, will we then see uh, a, a reinforced Certainly, breed, breeding program? If there was uh, some, some type of a more long-term solution where there was a little more stability, uh, it would encourage people to breed. And, um, and they do take the long-term um, view. They're looking down the road two or three years. So if they look at the racing legislation and see that it looks like there's going to be a viable uh, place for their horses to race in Massachusetts, maybe two or three years down the road, it'll impact breeding right away. Um, but obviously those horses wouldn't be in the pipeline to race for two or three years, but it would increase the breeding. Right. I mean, I can just tell you from my own personal observation, uh, that this the, the 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 last couple of years with the Finger Lakes program in conjunction with Suffolk Downs has produced a reliable um, target for breeders and owners to aim at, and um, the, the ten to thirteen, in other words, exactly. So just the interplay, I mean, just what you saw today with Suffolk Downs and the breeders and the horsemen all working together for their date so they don't step on each other's toes. You know, there's a, there's a place to go. There's a, there's a reasonable way to aim your horses. That has produced the interest that Arlene was talking about. And um, in the letter, it referenced those two gentlemen that came to our meeting. They were very excited about this program. They, I mean, I, they were talking about their investors that were also interested in the program and how, uh, I don't think I can adequately describe to you um, how much it takes to get a horseman out of the barn and go to a breeders meeting in Dedham on a weeknight. <laughs> For them to come and drive as far as they did and explain their enthusiasm is kind of like a tip, tip of the iceberg. There's, there is a lot of enthusiasm, and you will see more foals in Massachusetts because of it. Mm -hmm. And it is re directly related to the regular programming of races where they can count on purses. Mm -hmm. And if someone it were to come to fruition that someone was going to build a racetrack and they got all the right um, uh, you know, permits and uh, legislative changes needed, would that help the breeding Oh, yeah, program? they just need a target to aim at. That's, that's it. Place to bring them, place to, to run them. So on that note, if there was a sudden demand for more breeding money, uh, and I know this is not how we think of the Racehorse Development Fund, there's no pots, if you will, there's no um, reserves or any one of these. Um, would you then be requesting or, or assuming a lot more of the money that's available for uh, the breeding program? Would you would you be able to expand it to respond yes. to it? Oh, yes, that, that has been you know a, a little bit of a, a problem because as um, the um, amount of money for thoroughbreds decreases, so does the uh, amount of money for breeding decrease. So we've had to cut um, the number of stakes races we run, and we have had to cut the uh, purse money for the stakes races, and that doesn't help, you know, encourage breeding when they see us having to cut. So, I guess that's where I was going. If we, if we're uh, spending, if we're all spending the money on the races, does that come at a cost towards a potential demand, additional demand from the breeding program? Yeah. Yes, it does. Okay. Well, it's, what did what did the Prior to Suffolk Downs closing, where how was the thoroughbred? How was sorry? How was the breeders' share spent? What was it spent it on? It was spent on uh, purses for their races and um, breeders' awards. Uh, when a horse races and they're mass bred, the stallion owner and the mayor owner get bonuses. Right. Yeah. So that money, in addition to the purse money, would come out of the. Um, Part of their percentage the of the handle. Fund. So it's, it's always statute. been used. I, I think of it as sort of um, like we did in the women in construction. There's the demand side and the supply side. You know, you could use money to encourage people to have foals uh, or to generate, to, to breed foals. 
by paying incentives. If you have a full, you'll get some money. That's the supply side. The demand side is to have races with purses. Uh, and it, it, from this, this letter we got from this Adele Salim, it's he or she, whoever this is, was suggesting, <laughs> he, he was suggesting that the supply side ought to have the money, that the money ought to go to incentives to breed directly as opposed to racing, but it's out, which creates a demand for, for horses. It, it sounds like we've always, the thoroughbred money has always gone in a substantial amounts to purses, even the, back in the day when there were lots more horse racing, lots more thoroughbred racing going on. Well, but there was no race horse development fund by, back then. Back then. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Okay. Yeah. And I would say this a balance. This is the money that we're, over, right, right. That's we're overseeing. Well, it was, but it was for the first couple of years. When we had we had a full, tr a full but yeah, but uh, I suppose a, a lot of it is driven by the shorter meat. The shorter meat creates this uh, constraint on the on the demand, or was that the supply side? Um, it's on and the demand the, side. Of the yeah, on the demand meat, side, no which demand. then gets us to to it to these kinds of requests. Can we then raise elsewhere in Finger Lakes and whatnot? You know, what Mr. Salim says, you know, as far as uh, his letter, it, it's not too far off the mark. The problem is we're bound by a law. We tried to address that. We had an amendment that went in, and that whole law got changed, and they just uh, extended the chapter 128, 129. Right. So we have been trying, but we're bound by that law. You know, there's only so much we can do. Yeah, right. yeah. We've been trying to make that point to the legislature as well. We appreciate uh, that too. Because we, is we there, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Is there, a, is there a debate within the breeder world yeah. as to the better way to spend money? Do some people think it's best to put it on purses, or and other people think it's it's best to put it in direct incentives like payments for foals? Is there is there a debate, a philosophical difference there? Oh, we've discussed it, and like I said, we had an amendment going in. Uh, maybe a total rewrite of Chapter 128, as far as we were concerned. To, I mean, that law has been in effect for I don't know how many years. Right. It's got to be updated, but our, our hands are tied until we can change that law. When so you can't to use the, that. You can't use the, the the only awards that it allows in that law is 30 percent to the owner, 25 percent to the breeder, and 15 percent to a registered Massachusetts stallion for that horse. There are no other awards that we can change. We out can't of, even change those percentages. Out of the breeder's share. Yes. This is 128. This is the Agriculture Act. Yeah. So that determines what they can do with their breeding money. Their share. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we realize that there are other ways that we could in, mm. um, encourage breeding, but we're bound by that law. We keep trying to uh, putting in. So the person, so this um, Mr. Salim apparently doesn't understand that. that you I think he option. does. He, yeah. he's been a, he's been at our board meetings. Okay. I think every one of them. I yeah. think he understands okay. that. But right. I think there's more just an, a, a disagreement on the how much money should be allocated to either. It's both of those ideas are important. You need the money for the racehorses for purse money, and then you also need the breeders' awards, yes. and both of both of those are important for a breeding program. And then it's just some people have philosophical differences on how much should be allocated yeah. to. Okay. A balanced approach typically works. And best. we don't argue that there should uh, there should oh, be yeah. other awards. It's right. just trying to get it done. Right. Okay. It's Which this one-year extension that creates everything. You know, yeah, all these problems. All of these problems. Mr. Chair, um, I, um, I move that the Commission approve the request to the Massachusetts Thoroughbred Breeders Association to run six additional races. Second. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Thank you. Thank right. you. Good Thank luck you. to you. Thank you. And we are on to item eight, Commissioner's updates. Um, we got one from Commissioner Cameron already about Suffolk Downs. Any others? Anybody? Well, we wish you well, Commissioner Stebbins, and your um, duties. Des as designated as commissioner with no sleep. I'm like, right. Great. Just, just for the record, this was the commission's 250th meeting. Yeah, mm -hmm. I saw that. Right. 250th. Wow. Right, Move to, to adjourn, adjourn the 250th meeting. <laughs> Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.